This is the Patriots Catch-22 Podcast with Evan Lazar and Alex Barth. I'm Evan Lazar. Evan Lazar. Evan Lazar. Hello, everybody. Nailed it. Joined, as always, by our bar. That's a bit. That's a match. No risk it, no risk it. 22. Here is Evan Lazar and Alex Barth. And that's what's held up as the gold standard of draft. That is, you freaking nailed it. If you had a draft like that, you'd throw a parade almost for a draft like that. 22. I hope we're throwing a parade for a draft in a couple a couple months. We're, well, we're inside of two months now, right? We're, the the we're, context that was to throw it in three years because of the draft they have in a couple of months. Yeah, that's a little weird. Uh, maybe it's instant. I think that, that Saints draft was pretty instant. That's true. Yeah, that Marshawn Lattimore, that's Alvin Kamara. Uh, Evan Lazar, Alex Barth with you. Patriots Cash 22. Next couple of hours here, we're going to talk. We're going to talk draft. We're going to talk combine, as we always do. Uh, we have to recap the combine that that ended uh, on Sunday, and then we're also going to get into some free agency. I know free agency is on a lot of people's minds next week. Uh, free agency, frankly, for me, Alex is is not really at the top of mind, even though it starts on Monday. Because, uh, it, no, frankly, just like how bad this free agency class is, especially yeah. on offense. I and mean, look, the defense. Uh, there's encouraging guys, and I, I think you can really add in certain spots and. Maybe they go out and pay Christian Wilkins. Maybe they go out and pay a safety to pair with Duggar and Peppers who can really play the center field like a Justin Simmons or Xavier McKinney or someone like that. That's going to be encouraging. Uh, maybe they win the bidding war for Calvin Ridley. You know, the, there are guys Ooh. out there. I'm not trying to sit here and say there's nobody, but it, it really just goes to show, and uh, this isn't even where I was going to start because I was just going to get right into the combine, but I think what really goes to show as we get into the combine and the draft is the – premier talent let's just start with the receiver position but i also think this pertains to tackle as well uh, the premier talent does not hit unrestricted free nope. agency anymore no nope. and they're really the only way to acquire a t higgins is to trade for him or to draft him and right. there's not going to be any uh, there's not going to be a world anymore where a guy of that caliber becomes available similarly at tackle there's not going to be a world anymore where a premier tackle is just free on the open market to sign. Even last year, those guys that we had talked about a lot all had issues. Like right. they, they were all flawed players. I would add at quarterback. Well, yeah. it's not going to happen. Yeah. That one I think has been going on for a while. But tackle and receiver have become, I think, receiver uh, because of the value overall that they bring to the offense. And I think tackle because of the scarcity of good proven tackle play teams are just not giving those players away so if you're the new england patriots and you are a tackle wide receiver needy team as you are the good news is that that was maybe one of the best weekends of wide receiver and tackle workouts i've ever seen yeah. in my my time at least i've been watching the combine since i was a kid i can't remember a time where i saw that many wide receivers run a sub four five and just absolutely blow it out of the water. And guys that size running a sub four. Even five. guys that I have on my downs list, I looked up a couple uh, of guys that I was like, oh yeah, I didn't, I wasn't, you know, didn't love that guy. Their RAS is still top half of of the database. Right. You know, now uh, athletes does not a football player make. We should add that qualifier. Sure, but, but when with this class, it's you're combining good film with good athletes for the most part. Yeah. And that that's the difference. Uh, so I agree. I think the you know, the combine, the one thing that does just a little pet peeve, and then I want to get into it. We're going to give three up, three down from the combine. Like we do in season after games, we're going to just do it for the combine. 
and oh, we're also going to talk for agency. Like I said, our phone lines are still down. So if you want to uh, get involved in the show, you can do two things. Uh, you can email in at webradio at patriots.com as always. And uh, Barth is going to, uh, he's going to look at the YouTube comments a little bit and, and monitor those as well. So, can I add, can I add one more way? Sure. Let's say if we get, what would be like a dream, dream number for you, for people to be watching at once? Dream, dream number. 283. No, no, no. I Trust me. Set it higher. If we get know. a million people on the stream, a million, a million people. Evan will give out his phone number. You can call him live on the show and ask questions. Sure. I give out more and, than a phone number. Uh, <laughs> if a million people are watching, I will give out my phone number. We're, sure. we're at live right now. Oh, oh, we just got two more. We just there got two more. Get ready, Evan. But oh, no, uh, I'll, I'm, sw- I'm sweating over here. I'm watching the YouTube comments. If you guys have questions there, I'll try to pick out a couple. So my my least favorite thing about the combine, because you know yeah. we both love the combine. It's our it's right in our wheelhouse. I love it. I'm dying for you to come to Indy one year with us because we also have a good time outside of the combine. Yeah. Uh, but I would say that you know the the thing that bug, bugs me the most about the combine is on both sides of the spectrum. Uh, Xavier Worthy runs a four two one. Well, Tyquan Thornton ran a four two seven, and he stinks. Like, okay, Xavier Worthy was awesome at Texas. His right. film is awesome, and now he's the fastest receiver in the history. Player, fastest player, 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 Thank player, you. player, fastest player in the history of the NFL scouting combine that's been going on for thirty years. So you're combining the fact that at Texas you can turn on the film and be like, this guy, you can't catch this guy, and then you look at it and you say, oh yeah, you really can't catch this guy. So that that's right. One. Now the other side of it, it's is Keon Coleman, right? Who after he ran the four six, I tweet out and I'm like, I'm out on Keon. Oh, you're only out because You've of been his out forty. On Coleman, right. On I've Coleman. been out on Keon Coleman. He's not my type of guy. He's not my brand of receiver. I'm I'm out. I'm out. That being said, I'm not gonna put Keon Coleman on my downs list. But uh, we will get into that. But that's all I just wanted to say about the combine. It's all, all the combine is is confirming priors. Well, can, I think so, this guy is fast and he's fast. I think this guy is slow and he's slow. That if you if you have a guy that you thought was slow that ends up being fast, well then you got to throw it out and re- and start over, right? That that's what the combine's all about. So, just to revisit Xavier Worthy though, cuz he's obviously an extreme example. Yeah. And I see a lot of people pointing to this and look, it's fair I'm going to pull up the list of fastest 40 times. Um it's not good. It's 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 not good. It's considered a curse if you have the fastest forty. I gotta go through here. So you have um, John Ross, Chris Johnson's kind of seen as the exception. Yep. Dre Archer, Jerome Mathis, Marquise Goodwin, Stanford Route, Tyrone Calico, Jalen Myrick, J.J. Nelson, Jacoby Ford, Fabian Washington. So not exactly a lot of Fabian st- Washington was okay, but but yeah. not exactly a lot of stars on that list. Is my point. Uh, no. And those were the the ten fastest prior to this past week so people look at it and i remember when taekwon ran it and and people said this and i think now they feel vindicated in this take is that like a fast 40 some kind of curse or it's a it's a sign that a player is not going to be good here's the thing a lot of those players most of those players were not viewed as high value draft picks before they ran that 40 taekwon was supposed to be like a mid to late day three pick before he ran that 40 the guys that actually were projected high or is a guy like Chris Johnson who did turn out being good. Xavier Worthy is not Tyquan Thornton where he was relatively obscure, ran the 40 and suddenly popped on draft boards. I've been trying to get Evan to watch Xavier Worthy since last fall. Yeah. Since before he was draft eligible. Like we, I got something about that that's totally unrelated but related. Okay. But keep going. Xavier Worthy was a breakout star as a freshman. He's been one of the top receivers in college football for years now. He's been viewed as a potential first-round pick pretty much since his first year at Texas. Does that all mean he's automatically going to be good? No. I. He weighs 172 pounds. That's a legitimate concern. Yeah. Is is his durability? I think his, isn't, wasn't he like 165? Oh, yeah. I'm reading off his Wikipedia. You're right. Yeah. He came in at less than that. He came in at 5'11", 165. I remember because yeah. we were calling him Taller Zay Flowers, and then I saw that. I'm like, he's not really taller. He, he might just be Zay Flowers. He's a little taller than he's Zay. He's a little taller. He's not over six feet. He, I thought no. he was like 6'1", six, 6'2". Six, yeah, two. he was listed at like six, um, I think 6'1". So at Texas. there's legitimate concerns with him. Again, it's not to say that he's great either, but this is not your typical guy nobody knew about, ran a 4'2". Now suddenly everybody's obsessed with him. This is not that. This is a guy who was viewed as a blue chip prospect before he ran that 40 and 
a fact you shouldn't we shouldn't be dinging him for a fast 40 we shouldn't you shouldn't be saying yeah well i liked xavier worthy before but now he ran a super fast 40 and guys that run super fast 40s are, are never good so i'm out on him pe- well that's my thing is immediately after i said oh my god xavier worthy this guy you know whatever it was what is that like it's you're judging this on a four no no one's judging it on a 40 yard dash he was already like you said he was already right. a top 50 player in this draft and then he ran this 40 yard dash now do i do i move him up to the top 10 no i don't move him up to the top 10 with that being said i i do think that you know just to kind of start talking about this a little bit with right. the combine I would say that there are going to be NFL teams that are going to have Xavier Worthy extremely high yeah. on their board. Well, Pro- get, get ready for the Devonta Smith comps because that's that's yeah, how they're going to see. Like I think that there's a chance because of the uh, the film is great and then the forty is uh, elite. Right. That there's a chance that got you know look at a guy. I don't know if he made the the technical top ten list, but like a guy like Henry Ruggs ran in the four twos as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, pl- players like that. That uh, you know, Jalen Waddle didn't run. I don't think his draft year, but it was considered that he would run in in the four. Ruggs twos. ran a four two seven. Yeah. So those guys, all of a sudden, you know, Jalen Waddle went ahead of a lot of guys that were projected to go ahead of him. Uh, because of his speed. So I, I think Xavier Worthy could be one of those guys as well. Really quickly uh, as well with the draft. You mentioned that you've been trying to get me to watch Xavier Worthy for like a year. And this Since do- fall of 2022. <laughs> this dawned on me uh, for some reason this morning. Oh, because yesterday we were talking about uh, this off the air, obviously. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about like going back and searching names in our. Text I was going to say history. we should do. You, if you want to do that on the air, that could At be a some fun little experiment. Okay. And, and and just like how right or how wrong we were about certain guys, uh, I I think that my my development of my Zach Wilson take was one of the funnier ones to come yeah. from this. Where like in season uh, during college football season when I'm just scrolling Twitter and seeing highlights, I'm like, oh wow, that, this guy Zach Wilson might be pretty good. And then I actually like watch the film in like in March and I'm uh, never mind. I I, I was wrong. Uh, so th- those things and I the whole thing that sparked this was. This idea. By the way, I found my first text to you, uh, March 3rd, 2022. Wait till you see Xavier Worthy from Texas. Oh, my God. When you said you were talking about Justin Jefferson, you said he's the standard for prospects. I said, yeah. wait till you see Xavier Worthy from Texas. Two years. Well, he's not as, as well He's built. not the standard. He's, he's not, not the standard. Well but I'm Justin literally, Jefferson. it's over two years now I've been talking to you about this guy. Yeah. So last year, I distinctly remember, and the point that I'm trying to make here is that we've we've seen and I, Chris Sims is, is I texted you Worthy might run a sub four three. Chris Sims is is notorious for for what he did with his quarterback rankings. He always got to do something to get people talking. That's his job is is to get is to get people riled up. I get right. that. But we see all, we're seeing all these different quarterback rankings, ex ex players, you know, draft people, whatever that are all have a, a take on this quarterback class, which is totally fine. Everybody's entitled to their opinion. Uh, but what I'm seeing a lot of. Uh, especially from Chris Sims, who had Drake May as the sixth ranked quarterback in this class, is I'm seeing a lot of, a lot of people have some wild takes on Drake May specifically, but just on somebody, right? Whether yeah. you don't like Drake May, you don't like Jaden Daniels, whoever. And I remember last year, I was watching Josh Downs on UNC. Yeah. And I was impressed by Josh Downs. I thought he was a good player. I think he is a good player. But I remember specifically – We were big Josh Downs guys going through those texts. I forgot how how much we we were into Josh Downs. Downs. Yeah. I like the shifty slot receivers. You know, I grew up loving Wes Welker. It's just, you know, it is what I like. Uh, So Josh Downs – we're watching Josh Downs and watching Josh Downs. And I texted you, and I'm like, who is this quarterback, though, at North Carolina? Like, this this quarterback's got, you know, got some real talent. And we use a consensus board, mock draft database, right? And I remember – you telling me, oh, ne- that he's in next year's class. Like he's going to be a top five pick. Uh, this guy, he, he's you're right. Like your eyes are, you're he's a stud. And then I went out. I remember going on my draft database, and it was Caleb Williams one, yep. Drake May two. This was at the end of 2022. And what happens? I feel like with the draft process is that we go through a whole year of tearing these guys down. Right? It just it all of it. I mean, Caleb, right. Caleb is is has gotten some of, of it too, a lot of it. But luckily, I cooler heads are prevailing. Well, I think especially holding at sorry to jump in, but no, I think these guys that are on the map for multiple years, yeah, because last year Caleb could do no wrong, right? Because that was the year he broke out. Now we already know he can do no wrong. 
So you look at him a little closer and you start to see it versus a guy like Jaden Daniels who just popped onto the scene this year. Right. And he's kind of talked about the way Caleb Williams was last year. You see that a lot with the guys who are draft pros. And you're going to see it more because guys are going to stay in school because of NIL. You're going to start seeing the guys that are, you know, two, three, four-year starters. You're going to get more of this, we we call it, uh, prospect fatigue. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Which is a real thing. And it's because at a certain point, and you know who is great about this was um, Charles Davis during the combine was excellent at calling this out. Excellent. We've heard for two years now, Caleb Williams is going to be first overall pick. Caleb Williams, because he is, because he is, because he, he should be the first overall pick. Yeah. But we've heard it over and over and over. And there's only so many, we have to do, do, there's so many of these podcasts and so many of these columns and so many of this and that, that you need content. And eventually somebody one day has said, you know what? Everything that can be written about Caleb Williams going first overall has been written. What if he doesn't? Just as a hypothetical, what if he doesn't? Yeah. And then that catches steam. And then other people, because it's something new to talk about. And Marvin Harrison, we've talked about, is going to be the first wide receiver off the board. Because he is. And we've talked about it. We've talked about it. We've talked about it until somebody gets bored and says, well, what if he's not? What would that look like? And then that gets taken to another level. Same works in reverse. J.J. McCarthy. He's not that good. He's not that good. He's not that good. But what if he was? What would that look like? What right? if he was? And what I, if you just magically became good? Well, J.J. McCarthy is just the most amazing hypothetical quarterback of all time. He's right up there with Jimmy Garoppolo in terms of, like, the hypothetical goats. But we go through these rounds of prospect fatigue, and it annoys the crap out of me. I know it annoys the crap out of you. Look, if you see something different than people, you actually have the right to to say it. You absolutely have the right to say it. And you learn new things throughout the process that change your per- perspective. That's also fair. Just don't just don't take the bait when it's the what if conversation. When it's just just for the sake of throwing this against the wall, what if this? Don't yeah. take the bait on that one because if we if you want to do that, Evan, what if Joe Milton goes first overall? <laughs> okay, so back to the real point here. <laughs> uh, the the thing that I think really shocked me, not shocked me, but I, I guess the thing that I took away from the combine, just going to the combine and and talking to some people at the combine, was that. These NFL teams, I think we need to keep this in perspective. No NFL team is going through the pre-draft process of all this, the combine, the senior bowl, the 30 visits, all of this, and taking Drake May or Jaden, either one, taking Jaden Daniels and moving him from two to six on their board. Nobody's doing that. All these NFL teams have pretty much had these guys ranked in the same way for some time now. Now, when it comes to who they might actually draft, especially in a position like the Patriots at three overall, what really comes into play is then the, like the 30 visits and the interviews and all that kind of stuff. And just who do you gravitate towards it and who do you like? Because I think for a lot of NFL teams as well, there really isn't a major, major talent gap between Jaden Daniels and Drake May. So it's going to be a flavor thing. It's going to be a, a thing of, this is the playing style that I would prefer. This is the guy I prefer. This guy interviewed better than that guy. That guy interviewed better than this guy. So what it, I'm getting at is is that this is all media fodder. Right. That the, that all of a sudden, it, according to some guys, Drake May is QB6 and needs to sit for two years before even touching a football field. Like all, n- No one in the league has had a wild change of heart on him like that. So I, I would just put that in, into perspective when you see some of these these rankings and you see some of, uh, you know, the talk about these quarterbacks. You know, the, my, my other favorite thing that comes out of the combine every year is, you know, we polled league executives and they all, this is how, you know, they think that Drake May can't play and they think Jaden Daniels can't play. You know what I mean? Like the, the whole anonymous yeah. scout community. Yeah, it's, it's we talked to one, I don't mean to, keep picking on J.J. McCarthy, but he was kind of the poster boy for this this year. We talked to one league executive who thinks J.J. McCarthy is going to go third overall. All right, well, that guy's team probably is the 20-somethingth pick. Right. He's never going to be in position to make that decision, and he probably just said something crazy for the sake of saying something crazy. It doesn't matter if... It, all that matters when it comes to J.J. McCarthy and the third overall pick is what the Patriots think. Yeah. If they really like him, he's going to be the third overall pick. If they don't, he's not. If some league executive from, I just know they're at the bottom of the draft, the Chiefs, if Brett Veach goes to some reporter and says, I don't know why he would do this, but yeah. J.J. McCarthy could be the third overall pick, that doesn't actually mean anything. Yeah. So I, I think, and I guess I'm going to do it a little bit here, I think the, the consensus yeah. from Indy on this quarterback class is 
been pretty steady at this point that Caleb's obviously won. Yeah. I would say the consensus has Jaden Daniels at two. Drake may at three. But that's cl- like and, and it can be close. There's nothing yeah. wrong with it being close. And yeah. I think do you think it's all right, so sixteen teams in the league or thirty two teams in the league, sixteen sixteen split, do you think it could be like seventeen fifteen in favor of Daniels? Yeah. Is it like something close I think like that, that? Most people, you know, everybody you talk to said the same thing about the quarterbacks, yeah. and that was all three of these guys are top five picks. Are legit, in, right. And in, in pretty much any draft. Right. You know, yeah. it doesn't really matter. That the other thing that you heard a lot of though was that this class has those three guys and then JJ McCarthy's kind of the wild card. Yeah. And then not a lot of people that I talked to, and again, I just laid it out perfectly on purpose, that you talk to five people, those are five of a thousand people in personnel you know, scouting departments. It's just a person's opinion. It doesn't mean that it's 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 a hundred percent. Right. But really what you heard was Caleb, Jaden Daniels, Drake May, JJ McCarthy. And then Penix and Bo Nix was really just depending on who you asked. All right. Well, right? We're, we're, I want to talk about that one in, at some point. But I have a v- now very strong take on one of those guys. That that's that was the general consensus board, I would say, coming out of Indy. But I think the biggest question now, uh, if you're the Patriots, is let's say the Patriots are Jaden Daniels' team. Let's say that they they right. like Jaden Daniels. That's their guy. Is if the commanders take Jaden Daniels at two, do you not like Drake May to the point where you're trading out of the pick? Or are you okay with either one of those guys? Right. If you have So there was a report that the Patriots' new grading scale – is from like 5.0 to 9.0, right? Yeah. And I don't know exactly where. Let's just take that at face value, right? Yeah. If you like Jane Daniels better, but you have Jane Daniels as an 8.5 and you have Drake May as an 8.4. Right. Right. It's all right. Well, eh, we would have liked Jalen, but like we, we believe Drake May. We believe both these guys can win us a Super Bowl, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that that was that was what I gathered. I think that the the, the most important thing, though, that I, I can, can't hammer home enough is that the wild swings of stock that you hear from these prospects, and I think J.J. McCarthy is probably the best example of it. I think Drake May has had a little bit of this going on where his stock has well, taken they, on they some water. Well, they all have because you heard – we heard – I think these reports came out like in the same day or within a day or two of each other. Yeah. First it was – well, Jaden Daniels might actually be number one. It might not be Caleb Williams. Yeah. And then you that. heard – then you heard – J.J. McCarthy might go ahead of Jaden Daniels. So now J.J. McCarthy's beating out Jaden Daniels, who's beating out Caleb Williams. Yeah. So this is what I'm talking about. Right. When it comes so to who, so it depends on who you talk to, right? And, and right. how many people you talk to, and and what you know. One guy might say something crazy. The other guy might say something normal. Like it just. It I depends. also and I don't mean to pick on them. I'd probably do the same thing if I was in their shoes. Do you think these sources, you know, front office people, whoever. Ever just say crazy things to see how we'll react? Absolutely. Yeah. Just, just, just toy with us. Absolutely. You know, make the puppets and dance. You, and you have to remember, and not to, I don't want to play too much inside baseball with this, but not to remember that all these conversations happen at a time of night that probably none of us should be out at. That's true. And and it just, <laughs> it, it, none of it is really like about you know, it, it, it's it's a little bit dicey of whether or not you should really be reporting anything at that time of night, right? Like that. That's the bottom line. But I I, I think that. When you look at this quarterback class, J.J. McCarthy is probably going to settle somewhere, and the people in the league are going to be like, "Yeah, we've we've had J.J. McCarthy there for six months. Like you guys are j- right. welcome to the party." You know, Will Levis last year, right? You know, oh, he could be a top ten pick. I think Mel Kiper t- called him a top ten lock at one point. He goes top of the second round. <laughs> so, right. So uh, the league always viewed Will Levis as a as a Late first, early second round pick. I guarantee it. They did not all of a sudden completely sour on Will Levis. That's just not how it works. Let's get into the three up, three down uh, from the combine. Should we start with the positives? Let's start with the positives. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go uh, w- with my number one. Uh, both Texas wide receivers, I think. Oh, I did the same both. thing, and I thought you were going to get mad at me for that. Both Texas wide receivers, but I would actually specifically say A.D. Mitchell. I think A.D. Mitchell overall had a better combine. Yeah. 100% with you. Because A.D. Mitchell now has the body type 
that's you know a little bit thicker, a little bit more weight, a little bit taller uh, than Xavier Worthy. Uh, the ideal he has the ideal frame and he has the ideal athletic profile. Uh, him running a four three five took me by surprise. I thought that he was yeah. like maybe a mid four fours type of guy at the fastest. Uh, he has another gear I didn't know he had, and I, that it does make you question a little bit because he doesn't necessarily have that type of long speed that you see on film. Uh, like, you know, he doesn't yeah. necessarily play to a four, three, five all the time. Uh, but I wonder how much of that was pacing routes and, you know, opportunity to open it up and really run by people and things like that. Not, you know, one of the things about receivers, you don't want to go a hundred miles an hour all the time, right? Like you don't want right. to, you want to be that that's Taekwondo Thornton. He only has one gear, right? And it's, it's great that your gear is that fast. Uh, but it doesn't. Ha- that's not how you create separation. You create separation by pacing. That's right, how you win track meets. Yeah, changing your your route pacing. So, Ad Mitchell checked every single box. Uh, four three five at what two oh five two ten something like that six one six two. Uh, I would be absolutely shocked at this point if Ad Mitchell makes it out of the top twenty five. I think he's a top twenty twenty five pick all day, all day. And uh, he was excellent. And him and Brian Thomas Jr. are both top 25 picks now, I think, in, in this draft. Yeah, I mean, Brian Thomas was also – I mean, they are kind of had the same combine, similar yeah. guys, similar makeups. I wonder if Brian Thomas sneaks his way in the top 15. It's possible. Because he's past Keon Coleman now, which was kind of with that. Yeah. That uh, argument I think they was. both passed Keon Coleman. Yeah, that's true. I um, No, uh, the, LSU, the, the, the uh, Texas guys were awesome. Again, Xavier Worthy, don't freak out because of the 40. And there are people who are freaking out because of the 40. This isn't some guy, I'll say it again, not some guy that came out of nowhere. Like, we yeah. knew who he was. This is not Taekwondo. We knew he looked like a first-round pick. He's going to go to the Chiefs. He's going to be amazing. Yeah. Like, you get that, right? That's going to happen. Um, and then, yeah, Mitchell, I would. we, we talked, uh, we did this a couple weeks ago, right? We were talking about, would you rather have the big body X jump ball receiver or like the quick shifty slot guy. Would you rather have AJ Brown or Devonta Smith? And we we differ on that one. But how about like a six three guy who can go up and get it? Who also runs a four three, like a DK Metcalf kind yeah. of guy. Yeah. I I look at Brian Thomas and I look at AD Mitchell. They have me itching to trade up late in the first round because one of them's gonna fall. One of them's there's just as much as we hype this wide receiver class up. And look, I had I forget it was seven or eight wide receivers in the first round of my mock I did on Monday. It, what it was receivers and tackles one was seven one was eight it was half the first round was those two positions yeah but there's also not as much as i made that work there might have been some stretches in there in terms of picks how many teams need a wide receiver they're going to invest a first round pick in a wide receiver i just wonder if some of the, not to cut you off but i just wonder if some of these receivers are so good that even if it's not like a pressing need and that's on basically your... what my argument was yeah but i also think some teams are going to look at it and say there's so many good receivers on the board yeah we can wait so one of those guys is going to fall, and, you know, if A.D. Mitchell or Brian Thomas is still there at, like, 25, yeah. 26, they've got me itching to move back up because that's the kind of guy I would – that's the kind of guy you start building offense around. That's the kind of guy yeah. that commands double coverage. That's the kind of guy that you're talking about on a Tuesday morning. Um, that's the kind of guy I'd love to see them get. It's funny because there's this NFL Network special going on about Calvin Ridley, yeah. and Michael Pittman Jr. just housed a screen from, like, 25 yards out. And when I when I did AD Mitchell originally, uh, my comp was was Michael Pittman Jr. Yeah, and I think Michael Pittman Jr. ran maybe high four fours, low four fives. Like he's not a burner. He and I didn't necessarily see that with Mitchell on, on the film. Like I said earlier, uh, does that make me pause? Pittman ran a four five too. Yeah, does that make me pause and say uh, like, is he really a four three guy? Like a little bit, but at the same time, I I think that he's Michael Pittman Jr. Uh, with maybe a little bit more afterburners, yeah. which is that's that's scary if he yeah. lives up to that. So uh, he's a really good player, and I think Thomas is just a better version of that because he's yeah. bigger. Well, Thomas is more in my mind like true deep threat, like like vertical slot fades that type of right, stuff. Right, but I think he has it in him, and the LSU's offense just wasn't built like this. Yeah, no, they're, or, they're, or, they're they're go ball and, and bubble screen. That's he, the LSU right, offense where he's going to build so much off of that that you're going to be able to hit him on slants. Yeah, probably. And teams giving him the cushion, and he has it in him to seriously create after the catch off of those concepts. Yeah, so we talk a lot about Marvin Harrison Jr. in this category of a six foot three slot receiver. Yeah. I, I think A.D. Mitchell is not quite on that level, of course, but his ability to sink and cut is similar. Uh, I play him at the X, though. I would too, but I think that he's somebody that truly 
uh, runs routes. So who's, who's your at new that comp size. form? Who's your new comp I still form? like Michael Pittman Jr. Just okay. maybe a little bit more, a little bit more nos in the tank. You right. know, like yeah, a, I can throw. I, I'll, I'll throw the. I, I said Devontae Parker, but better the other week. That's well out the window. Yeah. They just he has he's very shifty. Yeah, and he can sink and cut, and he can release at the line of scrimmage. Again, can yeah. the Patriots just with the third overall pick draft the Texas offense? Yeah, I and just be done. I'm very very high on AD just, Mitchell. We're taking I, Texas. I, I think that at this point... With the third overall pick, the New England Patriots select the Texas Longhorns offense. I think he's easily my wide receiver five in this who, class. Who, Mitchell? Yeah. 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 Really good player. All right. Who do you, who else do you have on the list? Um, so, I ha- you know, I got to do it. Michael Panix. Yeah, he's on my list, clear, clear. He cleared the medical testing. Did we, did that we was just, big. Did we just have the same list? Uh, no, I definitely have a couple different than you. Um, <laughs> I think one of the other ones is the same, though. Yeah. Uh, came out, cleared the medical testing threw the ball not a good throwing day for really any of the quarterbacks we'll get to that but and I wouldn't even say Penix went above and beyond but he he looked better than just about everybody else he was out there with uh threw the ball well is healthy checked every box needed to check I still think he's a first round pick and I think I'm in the minority on that and I still have him as QB4 Me I too. still have him over McCarthy Me I know too. I'm in the minority on that I took McCarthy over him in the mock draft because I want to be right with the mock draft more than anything else but I if he's healthy and He's healthy doesn't mean you throw the injury concern out completely. Those are still things that happened and you're cautious of, but his knees aren't necessarily ticking time bombs. It's not something you're yeah. worried about right away. I think that's all enough that you, I'm going to be annoyed if he doesn't go in the first round. And he's not going to go in the first round, and I'm going to be annoyed. But I'm going to be annoyed when he doesn't why, go in the so first round. So why are you setting yourself up to be annoyed? Just, just Because that's, that's, that's the draft process. That's what we do. Here's the, the thing. Do you remember that- how, like— twitchy i was about will levis last year yeah and how much that uh, got yeah. under my skin i remember what when i was watching him in real time texting you about it and you wanted to jump through the phone because i said like a couple good things about him and you were ready to kill me that, he was just it was he, never gonna and i was right ready, by the way he's ready I, to kill me no, again but i was right i was telling there's no way there's no way this guy mary he's going second overall i know by the time we got to the end of the process yeah. i said there's no way and i was right and it's here's what annoys me about it it's be, it's it's not that oh I'm right you're wrong it's that it was never going to happen and we had to dedicate like serious time talking about it when there were other more interesting things we could have been talking about that's fair what enough. bugs me about Will Levis that's what's bugging me about JJ McCarthy yeah fair enough uh, the so, Michael Penix one bugs me just because a good player and a good guy is getting shafted that's what yeah. bugs me about that so Michael Penix uh, you mentioned all the medical stuff cleared and that's great I thought he threw the best ball in in the in the drills as well. Uh, I thought he threw the best ball of guys that are going to get drafted. Yeah, I actually yeah. thought one of the – Devin Leary threw the ball pretty well. I know. We got, I, a, we got an email about him. Okay, actually. I still wouldn't draft him, but we'll get to Devin Leary. I have a, I do have a Devin Leary take. But I, I, Michael Penix, I thought, threw the ball the best. I think one of the things that you see with Penix uh, that I've always liked about his game is is his uh, ability – You know, to I, I call it arm talent. Some people think arm talent's arm strength. I think arm talent is the ability to ha- have multiple pitches. Like when you need some air under it, you can put some air under it. When you can throw it, need to throw it through a keyhole, you can throw it through a keyhole. Uh, that's how I look at Michael Penix. Uh, you hear some of the rumblings afterwards, after the workouts, that the receivers that were there just loved catching his throws. Like very they catchable ball. Throw, you know, those pillowy Brady style. You know, the little pillowy throws. You know what? I have a proposal. We may need to make something. I'm actually going to propose to you analytics. Oh God! You ready for this? Pillowy throws? No. In talk, talking about arm strength, because we feathers. had a whole conversation a couple months ago where we disagreed on what arm talent was and all of that. Uh, yeah. To me, arm talent is the throws that make you go, oh, "What a ball! See, what no, a ball!" Right? That, what that, a... That's what PFF calls BTTs. That's those are big time throws. But don't big time throws have to be down the field? Yep. So I'm talking about. Let's say it's a five yard slant, but you zip it right between two defenders. Yeah. That's a what? Is that a big time throw? Uh, not very, so, probably not from five yards, but maybe like if you're so. Here's about, like, what I want to do next shot. year. I'm going to record when I watch a quarterback for full game. How many times I say oh, what a ball, and we're going to have what a balls per game, and that is going <laughs> to translate to arm what talent. What PFF does with BTT? No, they but that's just deep throws. That's all that is. No, it's, it's not just. It's deep not throws. just deep throws. It's mostly deep throws, isn't it? Yeah, but it's like they have a scale of like your jaw dropped like that, and and, and that's part of the reason why I think that. Both of us to an I don't know why, but speak that with that you. to me is arm talent. Arm talent to me is the, literally the, the talent in your arm. How many throws do you make that other guys can't make? Okay, 
Yeah, I think you know. To me, and that can be I, down the say, field. That can be we're short. We're saying some, some. We're kind of saying the same thing, with, but saying it a little bit differently. A shocker, like that. We never right. do that. Uh, I, I think the biggest thing for me is just. Oh, Penix led in big time throws like by a lot. You last know, there, year. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Penix was one, and Drake May was two. Yeah, but there, I mean, it's a met. There, Penix at forty three, May at thirty five, then Garrett Green at thirty one. I like Garrett Green. There's it's not a, in the draft, but I like. There's Garrett a Green. reason why I I my two preferred quarterbacks right now for the Patriots are they're drafting Drake May early or Penix in the second round because both of them have those types of moments on film that you say that's a throw like that's and a franchise quarterback for throw. the record because this this take has gotten lost in translation that's what I mean when I say Michael Penix is the best arm talent in this draft it doesn't mean he's the best quarterback yeah but when I there are more wow throws for Michael Penn even especially even Caleb well, Williams definitely last year I mean Caleb two years ago might have been better so I'm counting throws I'm not counting runs around dipsy yeah. doos around like that's not arm talent right I'm yeah. talking about how like just to, to, from the pocket right yeah boom I think both those guys consistently win from the pocket more than anybody else Jaden Daniels is really good at it too but Jaden Daniels uh did a lot of his production came on like a couple different concepts. So Jaden Daniels know? had the highest big time throw percentage of any of the guys in the draft. Yeah, I mean he's great too. I'm not trying to Jalen Milrow had wow. Okay, so I I thought Michael Penix did everything he yeah. could possibly have done, and uh, I thought he, he did the same thing at the Senior Bowl. Like it wasn't the Senior Bowl; he wasn't like lights out during practice, uh, but I thought that there's really not much more he can do. He was the Heisman runner-up. He was yeah. the runner-up for the national championship. He had a fantastic season at Washington. I still think he profiles as a high second-round pick. I know that's going to kill you. Right. So why? If he did everything he can do, why? I think because of the durability concerns. NFL teams are going to look at him. Right. And this is just my opinion. But NFL teams are going to look at him and they're going to say he's a first-round talent that had four major injuries in college. So we're going to take him at the top of the second round. And there's a very, very good chance that in three years, whoever took J.J. McCarthy at eight overall, we're going to be like, what morons? You you all passed on Michael Penix, which is what we told you all along. There's a good chance that that's going to happen. But the problem is for teams, I feel like, is that there's so much risk involved in taking an injury-prone player. It's why you – know, Oh, so m how many guys like we can talk about over the years fall out of the first round and go early second yeah, instead? It's, yeah. it's Rob Gronkowski, it's right? Dominic Keys. Well, yeah. Dom Dominic Keys went in the first round. It's, yeah. you know, Gronk went in the top of the second round uh, to the Patriots because he had the, all right, uh, fine, the injuries, fine, fine. right? Yeah. That's that's all I'm saying with Penix. Uh, so I, I agree that Penix had a good week. What, who else do you have? Um, I had uh, – so you're going to hate this that I'm doing it this way, but the tight ends, just full stop. You, you had them up? Yeah, did you not? Uh, I thought for what everybody's calling just a can't weak get, tight end class, I, I thought they had a good showing. I, yes, they did have a good showing and a better showing than I thought. Especially the Big Ten tight ends. I just can't get up for this tight end class. I just can't. I think so. Let me let me put it this way. I'm not saying suddenly you're going to draft a bunch of these guys 68th overall, but yeah, I'm much more encouraged about. I think there's more there in terms of project players to work with than initially thought. Like, Theo Johnson wasn't doing it for me until yeah. I kind of saw the testing, realized what kind of athlete fair. he was. Tip Ryman, right? Um, Tip Kate, Ryman, like, at 270 pounds? Right. It's absurd. Right. So, yeah. I that was you. a guy I just wrote off as, like, a blocking tight end UDFA Lee Smith. Okay, right. no, there's a little more athleticism there. I thought Cage Stover did himself a ton of favors. I thought he was great. So. He, I mean, I'm not like a podium guy. I'm not going to rank yeah. these guys based off of how they were in, with media at the podium. But Cade Stover is one of those guys that just – you would have run through a brick wall listening to that guy talk. Well, that's what you he, want from a tight end. Yeah, he was all serious all the time, uh, really uh, impressive. I agree with you the tight ends did a lot better than I expected. I think that the problem with college – versus the pros is so many of these guys in college just don't get used like they're going to get used in the pros. Like I think Theo Johnson from Penn State's a perfect example. According to to relative athletic score, he was the most athletic person at the combine this year. I mean, it makes sense. And the problem is is that Penn State just didn't really use him in the passing game all that much and he just doesn't have a ton of production. And so you look at all these things and you say in the pros, though, we're going to take them and we're going to make them a, a, a seam runner and we're going to have them do d these different things and it's going to tap yeah. into that potential. I think this class, last year's class, had a lot of guys that also had film. You know, Sam Laporta, he had right. film. Uh, you know, Michael Mayer had film. These guys don't have film, but they have some athletic traits. I for guess sure. 
would, would I – so, I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm doing a recency bias thing. So, this morning, right, I, I usually – I just put something on noise in the background while I'm writing, and I had on top five college football mixtapes of the last 20 years. And why? so – Why not? Because it was on my YouTube recommended. Uh, <laughs> so, I'm watching, like, Tavon Austin, yeah. DeAnthony Thomas, and I'm like – I'm I'm thinking like what would I have, if I was covering the draft back was then? Was Noel like Devine now. on there too? No, what it was it was it was uh, Reggie Bush, yeah. to Anthony Thomas, Tavon Austin, who's the best one, Tyron Matthew, who I think is second best in terms of mixtape, and Johnny Manziel. But the point being, I was watching. And I was kind of curious. I was like, these guys are like super unique players, and like how would I have evaluated them, knowing what I know now? Because Obviously, neither specifically Austin and Thomas, neither one of them panned out in the NFL. And I'm I'm looking at the plays, and then I went back and I watched some more because I was curious. I went down this rabbit hole, and I was like, "Yeah, like why didn't they work?" And some of it's size, but you look at it, but it's also like the NFL wasn't caught up to that yet. I'm never afraid to take a player because of the way they're used in college and being like, "Oh, there isn't an equivalent in the NFL." Because there's going to be an equivalent in the NFL within three years. That's just the way it goes now. The NFL just takes everything from college. So when I hear, oh, you know, it worked. In, it, it's one thing to be like level of talent. But in terms of usage, I look at it and I'm like, yeah, but the more this becomes like college offenses, that can, this isn't so much a take about like, oh, draft Theo Johnson the third round. Because it's just, you just made me think of it. It's more just a general thought that like, you can't necessarily be as afraid of, oh, well, this guy was used a certain way in college that won't translate to the NFL because well, the, odds are it's going to translate to the NFL sooner rather than later. Yeah, so the the big thing, you know, the biggest poster child for this is George Kittle. Right? George right. Kittle at Iowa what wasn't a big-time player at Iowa. It wasn't like he was putting up 800 yards or something like that at Iowa, and then obviously he comes to the pros, he's an all-pro retirement, yeah. uh, one of the best of the decade. That That's the poster child for it. There's a lot of other examples. Well, it's more the other way, like um, Percy Harvin. Right. Yeah. Put Percy Harvin. It put him in the draft now. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. Great. He's gonna tear. But nobody knew yet because yeah. that that it didn't translate yet until. And I think there was a hesitation at the time to do some of these were considered gimmicky college things. And now everybody's trying to do them. Yeah. All right. So that was completely. You just made me think of something that was mostly unrelated. Uh, do you, do you have any more in. ups? Oh uh, yeah, I got two more. Okay. I have one. Okay. One sleeper up. I went deep. Oh, I, there's another guy I thought we were gonna overlap on. I guess not. Little, Is it Frank Crum? Uh, no. Am I close? Yes. Um, who was the tackle from UCF? Tylen Tylen Grable. Tylen Grable. So I the second I I'll be honest I was not familiar with him. I, I was not familiar with your game. I'm sorry. The, no, the second I saw him test, I ran. I went to his page and I'm like, oh, this is the guy. This why, all of the measurables check all of the Elliott Wolf boxes. This is the guy on day three. Why am I not familiar with him? So uh, Ty, Tylen Grable from UCF. Yeah. 9.83 relative athletic score out of 10. Excellent yeah. athlete. Tested really well. Good size. I also talked to some of uh, – I talked to Galco, talked to some people down that were down at the Shrine Bowl. Uh, one of the guys that they they circled out of the guys that uh, that were ta- you know tackles down there at the East West Shrine, uh, unfortunately we didn't go this year. So I, I, I really didn't um, – wasn't familiar with a lot of the guys that, that perform well there. Uh, so Tylen Grable has had a great, great – pre-draft process yeah killed it at the shrine bowl killed it at the combine uh he is going to creep up into like the early day three conversation and one of my favorite things i did it in my mock draft that i posted this week one of my favorite things is to double dip at receiver and tackle oh Both yeah of them. you got it you tackle, got it receiver tackle receiver tackle receiver just take all of them take all of them and run and i, I think that tylen grable is probably not a day one starting tackle and there's another guy that i wrote down that i think would be more pro ready all right that's where i think we overlapped but maybe i it's not it's not a small school guy uh and i think that you know tyler grable is your developmental toolsy athlete tackle so if you take somebody at the top that's a little bit more uh seasoned and and a little bit more ready for the pros uh, this is a great flyer on like in like the fourth or fifth round on a guy that might be able to hit a huge ceiling yeah i he really does um again and i i think not just that he's a good player he checks the boxes they want checked at that position so length athleticism yeah exactly so he's definitely a name patriots fans should know 100 percent 
All right, so my other tackle is is this is not I'm not trying to tell you I discovered Roger Rosengarten. Okay. Uh, but Roger Rosengarten did really well. I was close to saying we were going to overlap. That. Obviously, with the, in the forty, he had the fastest forty. Yeah. It's, it's offensive line. I'm not really worried about the forty. Uh, but I, I talked to him for a little bit, and uh, I really knowledgeable, like really knowledgeable kid, understands uh, protections, understands the quarterback position really well. Uh, I thought that he really impressed me uh, just with the overall presentation, just a, a well-rounded. Uh, going to be, a, I think, a maybe not the ceiling. I don't know if he's going to be an all-pro tackle or anything like that, but I think he's going to be a really rock-solid swing slash starting right tackle right on that line that you can get right. early day three. And uh, he came in a little bit small. You know that's going to be a, a concern for him. Thirty-three and a half inch arms aren't isn't you know the not the biggest of guys, uh, but he definitely has that. I just know how to play offensive line. And that's a position that you always hear. It's not a natural position. It's not right. a natural technique. It's not something that just comes uh, instinctually to a lot of people, unless you're Joe Alt. Uh, so Roger Rosengarten, I think, is going to be a really rock-solid NFL player. And uh, I think some team is going to take him and just be really happy with his floor uh, as a prospect. So I liked him. He also mentioned that I, I asked him, you know, about playing right tackle versus left or whatever. And uh, he said that he, he played right tackle because they wanted him on Penix's blind side. They right, he's still a blind side blocker. The, the the Washington tackles are interesting in that sense. And I had Fatanu as one of my ups. Just oh, yeah. He was phenomenal. He was great, and, yeah. and he, he checked the, the box for arm length, which was the big thing for him. When he, yeah. I think he checked it by a lot, right? He's 34 and something. Yeah, yeah. So he, he plenty cleared it. Um, And then I had one more up, and I'll, we'll see how you feel about this one. Uh-oh. Isaac Garenda. Oh, the Louisville back? The Louisville running. I'm sorry. Running whatever he ran, like a 4-3 something at 220. Well, uh, you're going to see my downs in a second. So. Oh, you, you didn't put Garendo on the downs. No, why would I put him on the – not him. But oh. anyways, I'll tell you in a second. All right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I was I was really impressed um, with, I mean, all the tackles. Uh, yeah. But fought now – Oh my goodness! Is it fought now or is it Fatana? I I don't know. I did find out that it's Olu Fashionow. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah, he Fashionow. says he says Fashionow. All right. So we've been uh, apologies to him. We've yes. been butchering that. Yes. This is one another like inside baseball thing. Yeah. But it's cool to go to the combine and have these guys like tell you how you say their, their names. Yeah. You know, like uh, Kingsley uh, Suamitia. Suamitia. Okay, so I yeah. had that one right. Tia. Not, Suamitia. Yes. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not, that one I think not, I had. You know, obviously a tough name to pronounce. But Foshnu. 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 Yes. So you don't say the second A. Foshnu. Foshnu. Yeah. But he goes by Olu for his first name, right? Yes. Because his first name, I was stumbling. So all over. so somebody asked him, and yeah. yeah. Somebody asked him to say his whole name. Yeah. And he just said, he just laughs and he just goes, just call me Olu. Okay. So, all right. So I'll Olu Foshnu. Foshnu or Foshnu? <laughs> Is the second A in there or no? You've said it both ways now. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just telling you how it sounds, man. I'm just telling right, you how it we'll sounds. Find out. All right. We'll find out when they draft them. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, yeah. Fought, or were we going with Fatanu, Fatnow? F- I've been calling them Fatanu. Fatanu? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, my goodness. Uh, my goodness, what a workout that was. He, he was phenomenal. Uh, where, how high he goes, I, I don't know. So that's another um, guy that, like, if he falls like 25, 26, 27, do you yeah. start considering trading up? Yeah, uh, he he was great. Um, any more? Or we go to the downs. You got any thoughts on Garenda? Uh, not yet. I haven't haven't watched him. All right. Um, oh, I got one more up. Oh, I can't believe I almost forgot this. Oh, Bub Means. Oh my God, Bub Means from Pittsburgh. You are obsessed. You're obsessed. Just watch it's him. It's an obsession. Well, just watch him. I've texted Evan every day this, since the combine once a day, just bub means. I'm going to keep doing it until you watch him because he said you weren't going to watch him. Is this a combination? Is it that you really are impressed with how he plays in the in the, in the the combine? Or is it simply just because Tyquan Underwood coached him? Like, which one is it? Well, I think there's a good chance they draft him. Because of Tyquan Underwood. Because, well, that's an – well, no. Also, so I did this last week. I averaged yeah. out, right, all the numbers yeah, yeah. for the wide receivers. Wolf took in Green Bay – and he's he's like it's it's him it's him he so, between six and six three he's six one if the 40 matches up it all matches up and then he came out he did a great gauntlet drill which is the one drill i actually put like significant stock into yeah um i think he's gonna get lost in translation because that pittsburgh if you thought the patriots offense was tough to watch last year oh god pittsburgh was another animal 
in uh, not a good way. Uh, that was a rough offense. And it was because, basically, their quarterback was just too hurt to play, and they moved him to tight end, and then they didn't have any other quarterbacks really on the roster that were, like, legitimate Division One quarterbacks. And it all fell apart from there. If you go back – so Bub Means transferred from Louisiana Tech to Pittsburgh. If you yeah. go back and watch him at Louisiana Tech, the flashes at Pitt that you're worried about, oh, these are just flashes, show up with much more regularity – on his Louisiana Tech film. All and right. Here, here's your Bud Means minute. He's just, he's, well, if I'm going to keep texting you until you watch him. I'll just, watch, and him. watch I'll him. Just mix in one or two Louisiana Tech games. Like we did this mix, with mix the. Mix in water. All no, right, remember we it. did this with Jordan Addison last year. Yeah, you yeah. watched Jordan Addison at Pitt, pit, and pit. you were all confused. Or you watched yeah. him at USC, you were all confused. Like, go watch him at Pitt. Um, the fact that Taekwon coached him is good, and he's just a well, they need guys that can do a little bit of everything because they they don't have enough. They have enough dead weight they're going to have to carry at the receiver position that they're not going to be able to carry guys that specialize. So Bub Means does everything a little bit well. I think he's best at the vertical. Skinny post is a great route of his. That's obviously a big route and you know, what they're going to do with Van Pelt. Yeah, I, I, I he's, think he's, he's he's a double-dip guy. I wouldn't take him as the only does, receiver, but he's a double-dip guy. He does scream Packers receiver. Yeah, he, that's he, what I'm saying. Like, you know, if he – him and, like, uh, what's the – Wicks – the D- D- uh, D- Dotavian Wicks, D- Dotavian Wicks, like those type. That it's just these random Packers receivers that just obviously like Jaden Reed's a different thing. He was drafted in the top right. 100, but like these different Packers receivers that just come out of nowhere like every three years, and you're just like who? And you're like, oh yeah, that guy. All right, uh, right. No, no, no. Actually, that's a perfect comp. Wicks six one two zero five. Bub means six two two ten. Like I, 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 just I just watch Bub means. <laughs> Just watch Bub Means. Obsessed. Okay? It's an obsession. I, well, no, it's an obsession. It, once obsessed. you told me you weren't going to watch him, then it, be, I know, then I, it becomes I, a I mission. Say, I say those things just to Then it just becomes to, a mission. Just to do that to you. Is right. it, no, okay, let me put this way. This is not Bryce Ford Wheaton from last year. It's a oh little different than God. Bryce Ford Wheaton. <laughs> Your Bryce Ford Wheaton this year is Johnny Wilson. No, I'm not. No. My Bryce Ford Wheaton this year is Joe Milton. No, it's Johnny no, but Wilson. that's different because I wanted the Patriots to draft Bryce Ford. I don't know who my Bryce Ford Wheaton is this year. Bryce Ford Wheaton is the perfect example of why you can't just go off the combine. Well, right? we don't know whether or not he's good. He tore his ACL. He didn't play. Oh my God, no, he's not going to. Come on, come on, just just no. Taekwondo is we don't go off the combine. Uh, uh, anyways, uh, let's go to the downs, and uh, I know the kid from Louisville had a good combine. He 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 ran well and all that. But I just had all the running backs, the all the running backs outside of Garendo. It was pretty meh. So uh, it was pretty meh. But I'm not even doing this as like a Evan, you know, anti running backs take right now. It's not even like the point. I'm saying that it was all the running backs because. I think all these guys are just the same. And I know they all have different skills and stuff like that, yeah. but in terms of where you value them on the board. They're all early day three guys. They're all early day three guys. You could throw a dart against the board, and one guy's going to hit, and one guy's not going to hit, and you probably aren't going to have a great idea of which one's which. They are all the same. I will say the the one other guy I thought stood out a little bit was Jalen Wright. I thought he the went through the Tennessee. on Tennessee. Yeah, yeah. I thought he went through the on-field drills. Really, I mean, we've talked about like the running back early on day three. Marshawn Lloyd, I think, is going to sneak into day two. He's good. He's good. Yeah. I don't – so this kind of goes He's to He's the your, one running back in this class that excites me. Well, so this kind of goes to your point where I like Marshawn Lloyd, but I wouldn't – I wouldn't even necessarily trade back to the end of day three to get him. If you can get Jalen Wright at whatever it's going to be, 104, 105, 106, yeah. I don't think there's this massive gap between Jalen Wright and Marshawn Lloyd. I think – Marshawn Lloyd just played in an offense that better showcased his skills so teams are a little higher on him. I think in the NFL, they're going to be about the same player. This is such a dime a dozen running back class. There's no value in it because they're all the same. I'm fascinated to see when the run starts. It's You're probably right. It's probably going to be early day three. Like, no, it's going to be late day two. You're going to start seeing teams in the 90s trying to get ahead of it. Yeah. The good teams that can afford to take a running back, you know, on, in the third round, they're going to be like, all right, before everybody starts running. Well, the dumb thing is, so the two best running backs in this club, like Blake Quorum is going to be a second-round pick. But even he was unimpressive. No, but he's going to be a second-round pick, and then the second-best running back in this class is Jonathan Brooks, who's not going to play as a rookie because yeah. he tore his ACL at Texas. Everybody else, I agree with you, Trey Benson, Bucky Irving, Braylon Allen, Jalen Wright, Marshawn Lloyd, same guy. 
it's just same guy. So it's a, it's a very good. I do think class. the run starts late in the third. You're going to see a handful of running backs go in the top 100 in like the late 80s, early 90s. It's a great class for my fellow running backs don't matter crowd because it's just they're all the same. You could draft Bucky Irving, and he's going to get. He would probably give you the same production as as the next. But this guy. is a bet. No, no. Uh, hang on. I'm not going to let you do that. Hang on. I'm not going to let you do all that. All the same. But it's a bad class. It's a bad class. But it's a bad class. So, all right, are all, do tight ends not matter? You draft any one of those tight ends we talked about earlier. They're all the same. According to your logic, that means tight ends don't matter. No, that's not what I'm saying. No, but that's exactly what that's you just said. What I'm that's saying. exactly what you just said. It's a dime a dozen ex- position now. Was it a di- All right. That's last it. year, were they all the same last year? No, but that was a good class. This isn't a right, good so class. Right, so it being it, a bad class doesn't mean the position doesn't matter. Yeah, we go back to 22. Does. does quarterback not matter? Desmond Ritter, Kenny Pickett, Bailey Zappi. Is, is there a difference between any of them? No. Does that mean that position doesn't I, matter? Next I'd year you're going to get Travion Desmond. Henderson. Next year you're going to get Donovan Edwards. Next year you're going to get Rock Sanders. And His guess what? It's going to matter Sanders. again. It's Raheem Sanders is his nickname. That's cool. I like that. Ches Malusi. The, the only guy that out of this running back class that I think is is worth a damn is Marshawn Lloyd. That's it. You, do you actually have Marshawn Lloyd? And I like Marshawn Lloyd, but you don't have Marshawn Lloyd over Blake Corum. Come on now. Blake Corum is going to make— Blake Corum is literally Danny Woodhead. Blake Corum He's is going five, to make— six. Blake Corum is He's going— shorter than I am. Blake Corum is going to make J.J. McCarthy a top 15 pick. Do you realize how hard that is to do? It's not You've just Blake, watched J.J. It's not You've just watched Blake J.J. Corum, McCarthy. No, it's the whole operation. Blake Corum's Michigan. the best running back in this draft. You're kidding yourself. Uh, uh, it, it, it's like you had these tractor trailer sized holes, and we're supposed to be impressed with Blake Corum. Go back and watch the last both, couple years where the offensive both, line wasn't quite as good. Both those running backs at Michigan produced. Both of them. Donovan Edwards is going to be a top three or four back in next year's class. He's also very good. They just happen to be All the right. best running backs who, who, in the country. Your, who's your net? Who's on your list? All the running backs stunk. Uh, all right, so my downs, uh, I'm going to start with Bo Nix. I have a take on Bo Nix. <laughs> you think he stinks? I'm just – it's not even that he stinks. Bo Nix, I'm not, I was not expecting that. I am incredibly I, – I think I texted you this last night. I The things I've said about Joe Milton, right, where I don't know whether he's good or bad, but he's exciting. I feel – the same and the opposite about Bo. Nix. I don't know whether or not Bo Nix is good or bad. He just bores the crap out of me. <laughs> I just look. Here's a guy. I can't believe I just said here's a guy. Bo Nix is a guy. Here's a guy. Bo Nix is a guy that should show up in shorts and a t-shirt and hit slant routes and put him right on the money and everybody drools all over it, even though it has no football applications. He is accurate. He, but he hasn't been. He wasn't at the Senior Bowl. And he wasn't one of the more accurate quarterbacks. It wasn't to the point where it was noticeable, he has literally which it should be. the highest completion percentage in the history of college football. Right. Well, hang on. We'll get to that in a second. <laughs> what do you mean? I, right. No. So 70% his, of his passes. Right. So his accuracy, I should be blown away by his accuracy, especially in controlled settings. And I haven't been. Okay. That's disappointing. That's, That's what fair. I'm saying. That's No, I, you're exactly right. He does have the highest completion percentage in college football history. So why is he missing guys at the Senior Bowl and at the Combine? I think that Bo Nix is... I, I've said it to you before, and I, I don't know where – you're right. He's not toolsy Mac Jones. That's the wrong way to put it. But he's just – he's Zoe likes to say he's built like a linebacker. He's linebacker Mac Jones. He's Mac Jones with a little bit more physical tools. So I'm I not just, saying that he's you know Mac Jones with Josh Allen's arm talent. I'm not saying that. Yeah. I'm just saying he's, he's Mac Jones, but he's a little bit more mobile. He's got a little bit of a better arm. He's a little bit smaller. Yeah. The thing about Bo, Bo Nix is a great college quarterback. And I stand, and we did the list last weekend. I think I had him like third on my list of who was the best college quarterback. Yeah. But the big question with Bo Nix is outside of that Oregon offense, how much does it translate? Because we saw and just what, outside we, of structure. Like we he's saw what it looked to, like at Auburn. Well, he's no, going to have but, to be, if he's with a really good play designer, yeah. like if he's, you know, it's not going to happen because these teams have quarterbacks. But like if he was. On the lines with Ben Johnson, or he was with Kyle Shanahan. How about McVay? Or McVay. I wouldn't rule that one Where out. they can scheme open the first read for him yeah. all the time, because that's what he did at Oregon. Right. Right. If he can do that, then I think that he's one of those guys that will will be able to accurately put the ball where it needs to go. But, but here's my – but this is my point. The second you, you, you throw that out, he's not giving you anything. But this is my – all right. So – but Oregon, like he had years working with those receivers that compound – he's – he shouldn't be struggling in this setting. And he I don't know that he's been bad, but this is a setting that Bo Nix should show up in and thrive. And he's not. And if it happened at one of the two, fine, whatever. He's now failed to wow me at both the Senior Bowl and the Combine when he was supposed to be one of the better quarterbacks on the field. He didn't look it. I'm not saying, That's fair. like, I, 
I didn't take him in the first round of my last mock. I didn't mock. think he was overly impressive at the team. I, I moved him either. behind J.J. McCarthy on my big board, too. I now miss QB6. Yeah. So I just – I. I, you could do JJ, you could do Bo Nix on your own time. I especially as it relates to the Patriots. Yeah, I have zero interest. Oh in yeah, Bo they they have to draft somebody with a higher ceiling. Yeah, than Bo Nix. Uh, the comp that that uh, Daniel Jeremiah has been using for Bo Nix, which I, I think Daniel Jeremiah might skew a little bit more towards those ceiling comparisons yeah. that we talk about, is Alex Smith. You know, just accurate, can get the ball out on time, but down the field, not a lot of arm talent, not a lot of aggressiveness. Not a lot of out of structure play, but he can run a little bit. Like you know, he's a sneaky athlete, but he's not really a off platform, you know, off script athlete. Yeah, he's Kenny Pickett. He's he, smaller Kenny Pickett. He's he's vanilla ice cream. He is what it is. He's plain. It's boring. Yeah. yeah, and we actually, I, me and Taylor Kyle's did that. We can we did comps for each of the top quarterbacks, but as ice cream. So like we and that was that was my comp for Bo Nix. <laughs> that, that could go really store wrong. Store brand vanilla. I people seem to like it. It was fun. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's. A you want to know my comp for JJ McCarthy was? Uh oh, an empty bowl. <laughs> there could be ice cream in the bowl someday, and you know who knows what kind of ice cream it could be. But as of right <laughs> now, there's no ice cream in the bowl. There might be great ice cream in the bowl at some point, and you have a bowl to put the ice cream in. That's good. But there's no ice cream in the bowl right now. That's good, isn't that? That is really. That good. was my second that favorite. Is... My favorite one was um, uh, Joe Milton. Have you ever had cinnamon ice cream? Yeah. Yeah, it's powerful. Yeah. I don't know whether or not it's good or bad, but it's powerful. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, J.J. McCarthy, empty bowl. Yeah. Uh, all right. Hello, Jerry. <laughs> uh, man, that was that. You made me laugh on that one. That was pretty good. I think good. I said that to you before. A- empty bowl. I like that. Yeah. All right. Uh, my second down, and this this one kills me because as a tape guy, I want to trust the tape on it. Oh, we, but, I think this. I think I have this but guy, Troy too. Troy Franklin looked yep. horrible. I mean, yeah. just I, – I, I, you're not a friends person. I know that. I've seen, I mean, I've seen okay, it. Okay, have you seen Phoebe run? Yeah. Like, you know, it's just it. like. He's going through the gauntlet, and it looks like he's drunk. He's, like, going like this. Somebody tweeted that. It's like when they give you the uh, – did you ever in, in, like, high school, they give you the, the drunk goggles? Yeah. Did you have to do yeah. that? Yeah, that's probably what oh. we all looked like trying to and ride you mentioned the scooter earlier, with the drunk goggles. You mentioned earlier that uh, the one drill – that has some application is the gauntlet when it comes to yeah. receivers. And it, he was horrible. Terrible. And then on top of that, uh, he only ran a four, four, one. And I know that's like only a four, four, one, but he's a burner. That's his like, carrying trade. He's carrying trade of speed. His right. carrying trade is his vertical separation and speed and deep threat ability. And a uh, four, four, one is good, but it's not great. But it's not, not carrying. That's not carrying trade speed. That's no. okay. He's also fast. Yeah. Speed. Carrying trade speed when you're a vertical threat is four, two, one. That, that, that that's <laughs> he's a, not even really that, a vertical threat. That's what we're talking about yeah. when we're talking about speed. Yeah. Uh, so four four one is is good, but it's not great. Uh, or I guess I should say, it's good, but it's not elite. It's it's not good for him. Yeah. For the kind of player he is, you scale it to the kind of player he is. So that's not what you're bringing for. it full circle. And yeah. I on on Troy Franklin, and I I, I mean this as somebody that I, I think uh, you know I'm not trying to trash a, a guy that was in the building last year, Jalen Rager. I I, I can't. It's so much Jalen Rager to me right. because Jalen Rager was it tatted the exact same way, vertical, explosive, good speed. Baylor. Long, He's right, just Baylor. Baylor offense. Yeah. And I think that there's a lot of similarities between Baylor, TCU, you know, that that yeah. like it's just a lot of similarities there. And uh Jalen Rager uh, obviously ended up being a, a a bust for where he was drafted. Right. And, um, you know, that sort of thing. So I, I look at a lot of the the failed the failed archetypes in the Troy yeah. Franklin world, and a lot of them are, you know, the Jalen Rager types. You know, the, the, they don't work out at the right. next level. Not a lot. I've been trying to say it's, he's Taekwon. That's been my comp. I'm sticking to it. Slower Taekwon, I guess. I, so even slower Taekwon, um, yeah. My third down, and this is another – this is a guy I like, so I regret putting him on there. Not regret, but – also, maybe gives me some hope because every year there's one or two guys in the combine that test poorly yeah. that then become good players, and it's just like, oh, they had an off day. Like Puka, right? Yeah. Puka had a horrible combine outside of the gauntlet, but he just he didn't test well. Like, he's definitely a better athlete than what the combine showed. It wasn't his day. Yeah. Cam Kitchens. Yeah. Safety for my – I mean – you remind, His workout reminded me of Brian Branch. Similar thing where you got to turn on the tape with that guy, and the film is, is the film. Right. Terrible combine, but I, I've seen enough – of Cam Kitchens where I know maybe he doesn't have that straight line speed. He is more explosive of an athlete than he tested. I just, I've seen it too much 
to overwrite all of that. Now, I'm not saying the combine doesn't come into effect, but I know what I saw. Yeah, I know what I saw in Cam Kitchens, and this is why I almost liked that he's a down. Does he fall to 68? Might even further. Does he does he fall early in the fourth? Because you know I the NFL, think, like the, the athletic and, profile carries a lot of weight, right? And for the Patriots specifically, they got a guy up there. I think are we under football ops? Are we next to football ops? I don't know exactly we're, where we are relative we're to sort, We're sort of on the same level. All right, over there they got a guy over there, Alonzo Highsmith. Yep. Who knows Cam Kitchens? I talked to both him and the other uh, Miami safety about Alonzo Highsmith. Uh, uh, Williams, James Williams, yeah, right? Yep. Um, they got a guy over there who knows Cam Kitchens, who's worked a lot with Cam Kitchens. Yeah. And if he signs off, if Alonzo, uh, maybe Alonzo Highsmith looks at it and says what I'm saying. Hey, yeah. kid had a rough day. I don't yeah. know what happened, but this dude, we, we should get him in the building. He can play. I He had a bad combine, but I am not out on Cam Kitchens. I'm with you. I think a lot of I, – I mentioned Brian Branch last year from Alabama. Yeah. Brian Branch's film was like top 20 prospect in that draft last yeah. year. And because of the combine, he fell to the second round. And he was one of the best rookies in the NFL last year. Like there, that, that, there's a, a reason why the film is king. Right. And, and Brian Branch is a perfect example of that. I'm not quite there with Troy Franklin. I wish I could be king. Uh, tape See, I didn't, I didn't love the tape with Troy Franklin either. So, so I'm very comfortable writing him Maybe that's what it is. Off. Maybe instead the tape wasn't all that great uh, to begin with. I don't know. Uh, but, yeah, I'm with you on Cam Kitchens. Though, the, Nobody who, that T-steps the way Cam Kitchens did is a minus athlete. There's I'm just, just going to say that. There's also just you know his ability to, in center field. Like th- that takes a lot of anticipation and instincts that don't come naturally to a lot of people. So yeah, you could have you could be a safety with a four three, right? But if you're not jumping the route on time, you're not jumping the route on time. Right. The difference in the forty is not going to make up for the fact that you're three. And steps that that's late. that's where I like Cam Kitchens because he's still he's he he gets the football. Yeah, I never see him not get to the football. Yeah, I I bet you like his like his um in game testing and stuff like that is so much better. You know, that's I mean, not we can't get that right. Uh, no, it's tough to get. You can get like on a case by case basis, but it's tough to get the full reports and stuff that the teams get. All right, my last one. I'm gonna pull a Barth on this. No, oh, but I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna be outside the box. Okay, I am going to say a down is the entire NFL draft media. Complex? Complex. I almost did this. For hyping up J.J. McCarthy. I almost did this, and, and telling, I feel like I've got dug too into it the last couple days. And telling everybody that what they're seeing isn't what they're seeing and lying blatantly because for some reason someone in a high-ranking position or some ones in high-ranking positions in the NFL, in a front office, in Michigan, Jim Harbaugh, I don't know, but somebody— No, you said who it was. Jim Harbaugh? Yeah. Somebody is running a PR campaign for this kid, and it's not only is it a disservice to fans that now think that J.J. McCarthy is QB3 or QB2 or whatever, it's also a disservice to it's J.J. A McCarthy. It's massive disservice to J.J. So I was going to put yeah. – how I was going to – I was going to put J.J. McCarthy as a down and say he was fine because he was, he was fine. I don't want to say, He's, like, he, he yeah. had a terrible combine. He was okay, Yep. which, great, he was okay. The the hype around him is unfair because he's yeah. not he's not gonna live up to it he's not and no you, at least not right away I'm watching the combine Evan and I'm watching him throw and he's missing receivers especially to left yep and which is all over the film too by the I'm way I'm like finally we're gonna hear it calm down because first off first off I'm sorry the build up to the throwing session get the hell out of here yeah with the build up oh my just wait oh you think it's crazy that I'm saying JJ McCarthy could go through wait till you see him throw NFL teams can't wait to see him throw when he throws he's gonna prove Evan the way they talked about it I knew this would get him going. the way they talked about it, it was like yeah. the fourth time I've done this rant in the last week yeah grown men were going to weep <laughs> they were going to write sonnets about the way JJ McCarthy threw the football it was going to be the Quinn Nordeen 10 for 10 in stadium practice <laughs> of combine throwing set. All combine throwing sessions, I all that. throwing sessions, pro days, whatever, from here on out, we're going to be judged against the Mona Lisa <laughs> that J.J. McCarthy was going to give us in Indy, and he was okay. Uh, yeah. He wasn't bad. He wasn't good. He was okay. So Which the, is what the buildup was. But then, all right, he goes out there, and he's fine. I'm like, all right, thankfully we can relax. And then, look, I get Eisen's a, Mich- a Michigan guy, whatever, but yeah. they cut back to the desk. And Pete Traeger's drooling about him. Oh, Where did Pete Traeger I, go to school? I don't think it was Michigan. I, I, Eisen was pants off. I, and, pants, but that's, 
pants off. Here's the thing. I almost give Eisen a break because he does that every year for all the Michigan guys. It's just yeah. part of the combine. Like, I knew it was going to come from him. Jeremiah was okay about it, but they cut back to this. Schrager went to Emory University. I don't think J.J. McCarthy went there. The only one, <laughs> Charles Davis. Charles Davis was the only one who stood up for it. But, oh, my God, the, 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 the tongue bath that J.J. McCarthy got afterwards. I thought, Evan, I thought because I didn't go to the Combine and I get FOMO when I don't go to the Combine yeah. and I miss all these things. I'm like, great. They had a meeting that we now judge quarterbacks differently. Yeah, They must have all gotten together at St. <laughs> Elmo's, sucked down their shrimp. Nice nibble, by the way, on the social. Oh they God. must have gone to the combine and all had a meeting and said, all right, when I the guy— a, I took a giant bite out of that When the guy misses— too. No, you next to next to Deuce. You, Deuce, Deuce popped Deuce, the whole thing in his good, mouth like good a madman. And good for him. And good for him. He was, you had the he was J- complaining about the spice six hours later. You had the <laughs> J.J. McCarthy combine of bites. It was fine. It was okay. I'm not going to knock it. Deuce you're, had you're knocking it. Deuce right had now, the A. D. Mitchell combine <laughs> of bites. But I'm like, great. They went to St. Elmo's and they had this meeting that when you throw the ball ten feet over the guy's head on a fifteen yard out route, suddenly that's what we're looking for. <laughs> I have no idea where any of that came from. And before I get called a JJ McCarthy hater, you I feel bad for the kid. I that's that's where I'm I feel at bad it. for the kid. And I'm never gonna live up to that. I mean it so sincerely, I mean it hundred percent with sincerity that all this is this is a disservice to JJ McCarthy yes. because maybe NFL teams cooler heads prevail with the actual league and he's Will Levis and he ends up dropping to the top right. of the second round, which is probably where he should. But go. it was a disservice to Will Levis at the time because everybody was hyping him up this year. And it, I go back to Trey Lance. Yeah, I go back and and we hyped up Trey Lance. Now we weren't as experienced. I missed. I missed, in I, missed I missed on Trey Lance. Trey Lance was the same because it's it's the same thing as McCarthy. It's a little different because he's at FCS, but. There's just not enough evidence yeah. to prove that this guy is capable of what people are saying he's capable of. And that doesn't mean he's bad. I think if you feel strongly one way or the other about J.J. McCarthy, you're kidding yourself. If you think he's great, you're kidding yourself. If you think he sucks, you're kidding yourself. He is a wild card. He's a blank canvas. Again, the bowl's empty. There may be ice cream in it someday, but right now it's just an empty bowl. I also just feel like the team that drafts J.J. McCarthy – and let's say the league buys into this hype and he gets over draft. His, his ultimate success is going to – I mean, it matters for everybody, is, but – That fan base is going to kill him. Oh, yeah. Especially, Minnesota, Atlanta, New York. Well, but here's he goes the to thing, the like, Giants, Minnesota oh boy, or the be, Jets, I, I and I always say this, that the ultimate outcome is so heavily dependent on where the player goes, more than people yeah. realize. I think for J.J. McCarthy, it's even more so yeah. dependent on the location. Minnesota, assuming they get Kirk Cousins back, I actually kind of like for him. The Jets, yeah. I kind of like for him. What's Giants, the common theme? No, the Jets. You, oh, behind Aaron Rodgers. Right. What's Got the common it. theme here? I guess he could City. sit behind Daniel Jones. Yeah, yeah, okay. The Giants, I'll put the Giants on the list. If he goes somewhere and he has to play, like, maybe not week one, but, like, if he's playing by October his rookie year, the wheels are going to come off that thing fast. Yeah. That's Now Now he's Zach Wilson. Congratulations. Now he's yeah. Zach Wilson. I, I, just, I feel like I always feel bad for these guys that get – that get hyped like this and it's a disservice to them because they're not going to live up to it at the next level. Certainly not right away. And then people are already going to start bashing the pick and all this kind of, it's just, it's not good for anybody. But to the, to your point though, about the meeting at St. Elmo's that I also wasn't invited to yeah. where they, that's the biggest thing that frustrates me with JJ McCarthy is I, I, I trust my eyes maybe a little bit too much, but I do trust that I know what I'm looking at when it comes to this stuff. And I just don't, I don't see the top 10 talent that he's being touted as. And it just drives me nuts. Like I feels like I'm taking crazy pills. Like I don't know. I don't know what you're watching. And then I listen to people, uh, you know, I, I sent you that clip from Greg Cosell. Yeah. Who's another guy. I met him for the first time at the combine this year. And it was really cool to talk to him. Another guy that I look up to that just watches film all day, every single day. And he goes on a two minute rant about how JJ McCarthy is not even close. He's not even close. So the, prop- and, and so I know the people that are watching the tape agree with me. I know the people that are actually sitting down and studying the film agree with what i'm saying which tells me that jj mccarthy has a hype man it's probably jim harbaugh that's in the nfl that's telling all these media people how good he is yeah and and that is where this is all coming from yeah and and 
to be fair, maybe they're misconstruing him because Harbaugh said he could be the best Michigan quarterback since Brady. That That's not as high of a bar as it sounds. It's really not. It's really. All right, he has to be better than – I think he could be better than Chad Hattie. I think that's a yeah. very realistic expectation all right, let's, for J.J. McCarthy. Let's, but let's, yeah. let's move off of J.J. McCarthy. And uh, who, uh, who do you have that's left on your list? I think that was it. Bo Nix, Troy Franklin, Cam Kitchens. Okay, so that, there's your combine wrap-up. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I have it. one thought on the defense. We didn't talk about like any defense players. That's okay. You talked about Cam Kitchens. I did, but no, one. Well, I'm just curious if you agree on this. The entire defensive portion of the combine to me, chalk. Every guy tested exactly how I thought I he have tested. Never, I like I said earlier, we the combine is made for people like you and me. Yeah, I have never slept through a combine for a defensive performance that I did this year. And I at first I, I had was, no interest. I couldn't care less. I was not into it at all. It was in the, some of that. I think it does stem from the fact that the best defensive player is probably Dallas Turner and he he's might not like he's going to be late so in I the, thought in the, some of it in the top 10 like he's not even like you know it's not like they yeah. have like a Miles Garrett in this draft either so it's not a really great draft I thought some of it was also like oh the past don't really need a defensive player but no it's just like I'm trying to find like because afterwards I'm writing like my takeaways and like who was good who was bad and it was so hard to find guys that weren't just yeah he tested how we thought he was gonna test yeah, like it was, it was just it was chalk it was boring it was that's not a bad thing yeah it's not. It's not to say it's a bad class. It's just they're like. It, it's kind of a bad class. No, but I mean, it's there's good players, but it's it, there's good players. There's no blue chip players. You didn't get Jordan Davis running a sub five. You yeah, didn't get some. No. You didn't get like a ten RAS score on defense, right? Some guy testing through the roof, you, right? Or you didn't get guys totally falling on their face either. It was yeah. just it, it was exact. I could have written the recap of the defensive portion of the combine before it happened. I think there is a lot of on the defense side of the ball. Yeah. In this, I think a lot of NFL teams find like I keep saying like a lot of these NFL teams find solace in this that that they're safe picks. There's a lot of safe picks in this draft on defense. That are they going to be Miles Garrett? Are they going to be Nick Bosa? Are they going to be those types of game changers? Are they going to be corners that are are stud sauce gardener type corners? No, but there's a lot of really good football players that are just going to be good, solid, solid football NFL players, yeah. players for a while, especially, I would say, an edge defender. And you know how many nickel corners are in this draft? <laughs> so corners. many. If you need, The Patriots don't necessarily need a slot corner, uh, but there's so many sl- slot corners in this draft. The kid from Michigan uh, I was really good. Uh, was it Cinterelli? Cent- Cent- oh, Sa- uh, Sanders still. Yeah. I yeah. actually re- I, I wouldn't sorry, hate I if butchered the- that name. Well, he's a local guy. I know. We, we met, and we met his parents. On oh, the, did you? On the plane ride back, so I feel really bad. And I, he I had he had that. an interview. He had a really cool interview too. He's having a kid. Yeah. Um, yeah. I wouldn't hate if the Patriots added him. Like, or if he falls to early day three, which feels possible oh, but no. not probable. According to his dad, he's a first round pick. Oh, I mean, good for his dad. <laughs> no, they are really nice people. I don't mean. To um. Like if Belichick was still here, I'd be saying they were going to take him in the second round. Yeah, he because he, he's he's he, a football player. He not only does he. Here's what's so impressive about him. He's not one of these guys, like, plays boundary corner, he plays slot corner, he plays box safety, he plays free safety, and you think, all right, wow, that's, like, a lot. That's impressive. He was recruited to Michigan as a receiver. Yeah. So not only does he play all the positions on defense, he just started doing that two years ago, and he already learned them all. So he's a super impressive player. Again, I'd love to see him in New England. I don't know just where he's projected to go and what the Patriots need, where it works. I think he's a day two pick. He's definitely a guy four years from now who we'll be talking about in free agency. Yeah. Uh, but he, wherever he goes, unless I guess it's Buffalo, I'm going to be rooting for him. Yeah. And no, Buffalo yeah. needs him because they have no more football players. Local kid, great family, great parents. They're super nice. Never seen Mike do so smile so, so big that he was talking to, to his <laughs> family on the way back. Uh, yeah, it was, it, that's what the defense is though to me. Edge defenders, decent edge defender class, good depth to the edge defender class. If you need a nickel corner, there's like 500 of them. Uh, other than that, uh, I wasn't overly wowed or uh, with any of these guys at the at the Senior Bowl uh, anywhere. I think they're all just kind of are what they are, you know, run of the mill average NFL football players. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with that. You know that those guys are valuable, and you need to have those guys around too. Right. Uh, let's get into some free agency. No phone. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, I'm sure we'll have actually. I did get I week. did get one question yep. on YouTube. I don't know. You might not be able to answer this. Um. So just somebody because you said you talked to Greg Cosell. Oh yeah. no, you. Yeah, I did. No, but you didn't talk to him about McCarthy. You saw the clip of McCarthy. I saw him a clip of McCarthy. I just, I just. Oh, uh, somebody, somebody asked if he said anything about Drake May. Uh, so he, does, he's not a big Drake May fan okay. either. I think that you know he's one of those guys, and I don't want to get. I, I've already 
uh, you know, ragged on like Chris Sims and those people enough. Yeah. But I think a lot of people uh, watch, you know, guys like Drake May, guys like JJ McCarthy. And, uh, you know, if you're a guy that studies NFL quarterbacks and is was a former NFL quarterback, you see all the little nuances and details that they do badly. You know, the, his feet are right. bad here. Is you know his release is bad there, uh, his mechanics are off that you know, on this drop back yada yada yada, and uh, you know the draft it yes those things matter to an extent but uh, the things that matter more are are more of the big picture stuff you know the physical tools that what's between the ears that type of stuff you can drill footwork you can improve mechanics you can't make a guy bigger faster stronger you you just can't you also can't make a guy more competitive most of the time like that that's all stuff that becomes comes god given it's right. it's just in you or it's not and i think that's a big difference between somebody like a dan orlovsky like a, a chris sims like a kurt warner who have all all bashed the raw quarterbacks in this class to an extent and uh someone like me who likes strike may uh because of the fact that there's just so many things that you can't replicate i also wonder if this is more big picture thing but i generally when I do quarterbacks, I generally don't like more quarterbacks than I'd like. This year's an anomaly. And by the way, it was an anomaly before we knew the Patriots were going to be taking one. Like, you know, I've been high on this quarterback class since last year. Yeah. But I do feel like there's people, whether consciously or subconsciously, or whether like on purpose or subconsciously, that just know, hey, most quarterbacks don't work. Right. So if I'm out on all of them, odds are I'm going to be right more than I am wrong. Yeah. And I do think there's – and I've been guilty of that at times where if I'm 50-50 on a quarterback, my gut instinct is – my gut – if I'm 50-50, my gut instinct is to be out because I'm playing the odds at that point. Yeah. So I wonder if there's people that essentially I, – I don't do that as a whole. I do that on a player-to-player basis. I A quarterback has to win me over. He can't just not lose me. He has to win me over. I wonder if some people look at that big picture and just say, well, look, there's going to be – four, five, six quarterbacks that go in the first round. They're not all going to be studs. Yep. If I'm just out on all of them, I play the numbers, I probably end up... And I'm not saying that's ultimately the driving force, I, but... I, I I couldn't agree with I you I always more. feel like there's... I know there's fans that do that, because my yeah. brother does it. And it's totally fair. Like, I think a lot of people, our experience with this is obviously the 2021 quarterback class. Uh, recent experience, I should say. Yeah. And there's a lot of people that look at that 21 class and say... Trevor Lawrence is the only guy that's even really remotely close to franchise quarterback caliber. Right. He might not be on his team a year from now. And he, they, you drafted five guys in the top 15 in that class, and one of them, right? maybe one of them can play. So why am I going to say that all these guys are good well, or three of these Trey guys Lance are good? Zach Wilson shouldn't have been top 15 picks. But. Yeah, or two of these guys are good when I know that we would be lucky if one of these guys is good. And I totally understand that, but, uh, you know, look, that – we, this is our job. This is our job is to project, try to project these guys. Our job is to try to tell you who we like and who we don't like. And that it's not our job to sit here and tell you, well, in reality, Caleb's probably going to be the only good one. So don't even bother with the other five. <laughs> right. That's why that's not the show. You know, that's not, that's not the gig. Um, I even said, I, do I, I don't remember if I said it on this show. I don't remember what show I said on where part of me too, especially with Drake may is like, I missed the boat on Justin Herbert. Mm-hmm. I wasn't like super out on Justin Herbert. I didn't love him. I definitely missed the boat on Josh Allen. Yeah, like I didn't thought he'd you. be out of the league. I'm not. That's a big part of my basis for liking Drake May. Like, if I'm being honest, is I've seen enough guys with that skill set now that even if I personally don't like the skill set, it translates. Like I'm seeing the evidence, and there's there's less misses of that skill set in between. Yeah. So I I just think yep. there's 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 an element of that. In it so. Too. I, I was out on Josh Allen. I thought people were crazy with Josh Allen. You loved No, shut up. You loved Josh Allen. Not in the draft. Oh, no. you, lo- you Remember we had that whole argument where they were both bad their first year, and I said Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson are the same player? Oh, yeah, that and was then, bad. Well, no, I was right. No, you weren't. No, I'm, you're right. I wasn't right because Lamar Jackson can win an MVP. But Yeah, Lamar Jackson has two. MVPs in his in his trophy case. Well, you got to win one before you can win two. That's how they're not going to give you your second one before you win your first one. So Josh Allen... I, I didn't hate Justin Herbert. I, I, I like Justin Herbert quite a bit. Um, but his Justin Herbert, I think, was a little bit different than what Drake May is. Ju- Justin Herbert's issue was the, was that offense, the Oregon offense. But the, a lot of the critiques were the same. Similar. Yeah. Yeah. And so I would say that the one thing that I have, have taken away from all these quarterbacks 
and and learn and trying to learn about where my mistakes were and and try to get better at this i think the the thing that you learn is that if you and i tweeted this out yesterday or the day before if you have the physical tools because you have to have a baseline of physical tools. Yes. I know everybody sits here and tells me, how could you watch Tom Brady for 20 years and think physical tools are the most important? It's not about them being the most important, but you have to have a baseline of physical Well, that ability. was also 20 years ago. And it was also 20 years ago. Yeah. But, and, and Brady... But Brady had underrated physical tools. And he also it turned out to be. developed physically a lot between which getting is, drafted. Which and, is extremely rare. Which, yeah, that doesn't usually happen. Extremely rare. And... So it's physical tools. It's almost like Tom Brady's a one of one guy and we shouldn't compare anybody to him ever. Exactly. It's physical tools and it's being able to see the game. Right. Diagnose defenses, have instincts, understand where your your progressions and where you're supposed to go with the ball. I would say having good eyes. Right. Your eyes are in the right places. If your intentions are good, if your eyes are in the right places and you're making the right decisions within the framework of the scheme and you have the, the physical tools. I will fix the other stuff. I'll I will I will fix your drops. I'll fix your footwork. I'll tighten up your release. I'll I can fix all those things. If you have the instincts for the game and you have the physical tools. Right. And a lot of those guys, Josh Allen, Justin Herbert, Patrick Mahomes, all of these guys and I still don't know that Josh Allen saw the field right or sees the field right, but all those th- but for the most come on. Yeah. He doesn't you don't throw you don't have his success without being able to see the field. You don't have his success without having Stefan Diggs. Oh God. Let's not do this. The point being right, he's not gonna have Stefan Diggs much longer. <laughs> the point being is that those guys all hit because those guys had those two baselines. And all of the little minutiae that everybody yeah. you know picks and prods during draft season, th- those all got fixed and thrown out the door. And so if you have that to me, that's the that's the number one thing. That's why I have Caleb number one and I have Drake May number two is because they see it and they have good arm talent. And and all the rest of it, I think, will fall into place. And they're mobile, right? Yeah. And, and mobile all enough. Are, mobile, uh, you don't need to be – you don't need to be Jane Daniels, right? No. It, but you don't need to be Josh Allen. But you need to be – you can't be a statue. Yeah. All right. Free agency. Let's do the last 30 minutes on free agency. Let's not get back on the draft, all right? That's what we always yeah, do. Yeah, it's going to happen. It's going to happen, I know. All right, a uh, couple of things on free agency. First, I, I, I do want to get our takes out there about the transition tag uh, for Kyle Duggar, which I don't think was a major surprise. You know, Mike Reese wrote a couple weeks ago now on in his Sunday column uh, that Kyle Duggar was a prime franchise tag candidate. Yeah. So you knew that there were already whispers that they were not going to just let Duggar go to market. They were going to either tag him, franchise tag him, transition is what they ended up settling on. But regardless, they were going to try to maintain some sort of team control over Kyle Duggar. What, what are your opinions on them going this this route in particular? I, I, I don't really understand it. I don't. I think that the franchise tag is for a player you can't afford to lose that you know you're going to lose. I don't think Kyle Duggar is either of those things. Now, that doesn't mean Kyle Duggar is not a good player, but – you have Jabril Peppers, you have Marte Mopple, you have guys that can play in the box, that can do the things Kyle Duggar does. And this was also suddenly a great free safety class. And I'd love to see them be able, or a great safety class, but I'd love to see them be able to add a Justin Simmons or a Xavier McKinney. And instead of being so redundant at that position, add somebody who can play on the back end. On top of that, Mike Onwenu is the one you can't afford to lose. And it's sounding more and more like he's going to hit the market and it's going to be tough to get him back. He's the one I would have tagged, not Kyle Duggar. I just don't think Kyle Duggar was that, the way that the roster is built. Now, this is a tricky year because you have people taking over a roster that, and we've, re- I mean, we've never dealt with this in terms of following this team. Yeah. Elliot Wolf doesn't have a ton of ties to these players in terms of he he's not the one who brought him in. Like Elliot Wolf, Bill Belichick had a plan for Marte Mapu. Who's to say Elliot Wolf has the same plan? Elliot Wolf may look at him and say he's a special teams player, right? Right. So there there's an element of that, but. I just think oh, when it was the guy you can't afford to lose, you already need one tackle. You might need two. Duggar, you had, is going to be an easier guy to replace. I think would have been an easier guy to negotiate with, too. Just Michael and when it's nothing against Michael and when for acting as his own agent, but that's there's a level of complexity there that just doesn't exist with other players. And, the, and Kyle Duggar's agent is a long time. Uh, he was Devin McCourty's agent, yeah. Jason McCourty's yeah. agent. Uh, they have a really good relationship. I, I, I would have tagged – if you're going to tag some – and look, if they were worried that they were going to tag on Wenu and he was going to hold out and they weren't going to have him, like, fine. I just think it was a lot of just, money. 
It's almost $22 million. Well, one, the goal should be to extend them. It will, no, because they could use transition tag. They still could use transition tag. They could have. And, and the transition okay, okay. tag so makes sense here. This. Wait, hang on. The transition tag makes sense here because you go to a window and say, we think you're a guard, you think you're a tackle. The league thinks you're a tackle. We'll agree. Go out there. Um, then don't tag anybody. Then don't tag anybody. I, I would I'd love for them to have more flexibility at the safety position than they do right now. Okay, so here here's my rebuttal because I actually I, – I, I like Kyle Duggar as a player. I like him as people. a player too, but it's it's – you're, it's not about collecting talent. It's about building a team. So here's the thing. That still holds true. I The couple reasons why I'm, I would like to keep Kyle Duggar around. One, we just talked about this uh, with the quarterbacks. If he was coming off his 2022 season, yeah. would you feel differently about him staying around? If they also had Peppers coming off the season he just had, not entirely. So here's my thought on that. I wonder – I think Peppers is a good player. I love his attitude. Yeah. I love him in the locker room. I love. I want to keep him around. All those things. I don't think that Peppers. I think Peppers. I think his 2023 season was similar to Kyle Duggar's 2022 season, where the ball just kind of found him a lot. And I think he, see, I think he found the ball because that's the player he's always been. He's been that since college. Maybe I. And he was just coming off an injury. I think it's in really hard. First of all, just off the top. Yeah. I think it's a really Kyle Duggar is a guy that in a in a bad era for Patriots drafting. Yeah. He was a top pick, not first round pick, but a top pick because of where they picked that so year. So I, I, I get that. I get they that. drafted, they developed into a quality starter and is one of their guys. And he's one of the, Gerard Mayo's guys. Like Gerard Mayo was in the building for that yeah, whole time. Look, I, I, let me, let me be clear about it. I'm not saying kick Kyle Duggar to the curb. I'm saying when we are specifically talking about the franchise tag. Yeah. So everything you're just saying is all the more reason to actually go out and give him a – you franchise tag somebody because you don't want to give him a fair deal. That's what that is. Yeah. You franchise tag somebody because you don't want to pay him what they're worth. If Kyle Duggar is this important to the organization, pay him what he's worth. I think they will. I think they will. Well, if they can do that – again, the argument isn't whether or not to keep Kyle Duggar. I want to be clear about that. Like, if, just be, if they didn't tag him, I wouldn't be sitting here saying don't try to keep Kyle Duggar. Yeah. I just think for what the franchise tag is – it makes more sense for a player like Mike Unwin who like than it does okay. for a guy like so Kyle Duggar. So I'll I'll get to that in a second. Yeah, Kyle Duggar. The other thing I think is is easier said than done with Kyle Duggar is really twofold. One, experience in the defense. They don't have yeah. a lot of experience back there anymore. Devin McCourty's not walking through the door. He's not coming back. They got what? They got Pepper's been here for two years. They got Jonathan Jones. I'm sure Miles Bryant will be back. I, but I, but I'm talking about like communicators, like guys that are in the back. Jonathan Jones. Yeah, I don't. Jonathan Jones is not communicating. Jabril from the Peppers spot. Is a communicator last year. I guess. Again, I, Miles Bryant will be back. I just think I look at that spot and say, one thing that Gerard Mayo said about Kyle Duggar, I think it was at the combine when he was talking about him, is how he really stepped up as a communicator back there yeah. without Devin McCourty as, as you know, kind of the leader of that secondary. I think that's big. I, the other thing that's really big, just from a, a real football standpoint, do you know how many hats on a given Sunday Kyle Duggar can can wear and does wear for this defense? Just just looking at like his PFF snaps by position, you can get a good idea of it. And I could then break down, you know, the actual roles and responsibilities within the scheme that he has right. to take on. We're talking about a guy that. Can play overhang defender, like you know, slot defender, whatever you want to call it. Can play at the second level of the defense. Can blitz. Can run fit on the ball. Can set the edge of the defense. Can play center field. Can play man to man. Okay, against you tight put. Ends. Hang on, you put center field very late on that list, and this is my big point in this. I'm gonna get to it. Okay, so I, he does all these things. Yeah, right. It's very hard to do. I understand Jabril Peppers had a good year last year. Yeah. Um, Jabril Peppers is not that kind of player. He also had a very good finish to the 22 season. I just don't think that he he's as flexible as Kyle Duggar. He's not as – but if you move on from Kyle – and again, I, I would say, yes, keep Kyle Duggar. I just want them to be able to add a free safety. I just want a so, real free so safety. So here's, here's the thing. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to quell your concerns. All right. This – is the other thing. Yeah. This safety free agency class is loaded. Yeah. Because the league has decided that safeties are like running backs and they don't need them. That's the that's Great. the bottom line. 
The league has devalued safeties. Yeah, devalued the last line of defense. The Excellent. only guy that has any sort of type of value is if you are like an Antoine Whitfield Jr. If right. you are an elite, elite ball hawking free safety. Other than that, you're not valuable. And so I look at a guy that was just released today, Justin Simmons. Love him. Would love Justin Simmons. Great, here. great up yeah. top safety, center field safety that could come in here. Won't he's not going to cost you a ton of money. It's not Jesse Bates. He's not right. going to get that type of contract. He's going to get a two-year contract for $20 million, and for one year, maybe two, he's going to be able to go and play up top for you. And you can do that, and you can put Kyle Duggar back where he belongs. Jabril Peppers is your third safety, so, okay, and so everybody fits back This into is place. my point. Don't pay Kyle Duggar to make him a free safety, and don't pay Kyle Duggar to make Jabril Peppers a free safety. Stop playing guys out of position. I think what they're doing, so I think that they want to get back to that three safety. So if they, they do Denver. that, great. And again, my take was never get rid of Kyle Duggar. Yeah. But and this is a separate take. If they lose Michael and Wenu, I'm going to be annoyed. Okay, well, I, that's just if they lose. Let's get to Onwenu, I, think they they kept, I think they could have kept. I think they could have kept Kyle Duggar without the tag. I don't know that keeping Michael and Wenu without the tag is as realistic as maybe it sounds. That's fair. I so the, I think that the Patriots. I I don't know this for a fact, but I think at some point in this off season, yeah, we we talked a lot about Cam Kitchens today. He's another guy that can play that role. I think at some point they are going to add a center fielder. Okay, the, and they are going to put they are going to want this. The couple things that Demarcus Govington said when he was talking to us in his introductory press conference is they want to be faster. They want to be they want to turn the ball over yeah. more. I think that's a big one. Turn the ball over more. If you can put Kyle Duggar and Jabril Peppers back near the football together, yeah. now you have two guys that can go get the football and can make plays on the football. And then you have the, the guy playing post, you know, the Duran Harmon playing post safety, and he's just doing his job back there. Right. And, and I think that that's sort of what the, the, the idea is. Will they be at the top of the market of, you know, Xavier McKinney, who's probably going to make some money? I don't know. Maybe it's Justin Simmons, who's now a, a depreciated asset. You know, uh, I mean, I would take cut. Simmons. I Simmons. I you make it sound like Simmons is a, a consolation prize. I wouldn't go that far. I'm not saying he's a consolation prize. He's just older and and isn't you know at the top. All right, of but his he game gets anymore. you through. But he gets you through until you can draft a guy or whatever. The one yeah. other guy is Geno Stone. I wonder if they. Yeah, any one of those yeah. guys. I think those guys are all in play, and I do think that they want to get back to the Devin McCourty thing, and I think it relates back to Drod Mayo played in some of those defenses with Chung, McCourty, Harmon, and they had very specific, this was your job. Yeah. This is your job. On third down, we all knew, and Devin McCourty told me this at the beginning of last year, which was he what he felt was going to be the biggest hurdle for that group last year was when the money's on the line and it's third down in the game in the fourth quarter, who's doing what? Whose responsibility is what? This, I think, they would like to define the roles a little bit better back there than what they had this year. So I think you're getting your free safety. If I get the free – look, it's it's essentially two different takes. A long want, way of telling you that I think you're going to get what you want. I want them to <laughs> add a free safety, and that would be great. I just I, – I, I worry about what the line's going to look like without Mike Onwenu. Okay, so let's talk about Mike Onwenu. That's obviously the other big one to drop. And I say this as somebody that I I, I think Mike Onwenu can play in any in any scheme, and I think he, he's a really rock solid offensive lineman. I I talked to uh, Brandon Thorne. You know Brandon Thorne, right? Yeah. O- offensive line guru. Uh, hopefully, big uh, JJ McCarthy uh, guy. <laughs> is he? Oh yeah, I think so. I no, is that no. I'm thinking of no, who's uh Thor? Yeah, a different guy. Okay, yeah. Uh, so Brandon Thorne, trust his eye on offensive line a ton, and uh, he he we were talking about the different options for the Patriots and and whatnot, and he's he tell, told me that he watched every single snap Mike on one who played at tackle last year, and he said that his pass protection tape was terrible at right. right tackle. I I just I don't see Mike on one who has a tackle. And I look at this regime, and I know they want to be more wide zone heavy. I know they want to do that more under AVP. That that That's really what Cleveland was all about until they couldn't be all about that. And I, I really feel like you have to have the conversation of positional value at guard and scheme fit with Mike Onwenu. I don't think it, it probably turns out that it doesn't matter, right? Like he's good enough that it probably doesn't matter. But I, I do wonder where they're at in terms of his va- overall value 
uh, when you factor in the whole big picture, is making Mike Onwenu an eighteen million dollar guard the best thing for this team? I I think, but you said like you think he can play. T- I just I don't think he can play tackle. Not in this o- offense. I think he's a guard, hundred percent. Is he a better option in this offense than Calvin Anderson or Verdarian Lowe? Well, yeah, but like they're going to do better than that. There's not much in terms of options. There aren't much to do. It, better. There's a million unless tackles you, in the unless draft. Unless you had a home run in the draft, but like you got to nail that pick now. And does that become 34? Now, what are you doing at receiver? Yeah, I think it becomes 34. I would think your receiver. We talked about this. They they can get receivers at 68. They can get they can get receivers in this class at 68. They can. And I I just. I, I worry about him at tackle. I think he's a guard. I think putting him out at tackle is really was he's a guard that can play tackle in a pinch. Yeah. He's not a tackle that can also play guard. Right? Like, that that's the way that he goes. I just – I I'd, I I think you could get a year out of him. I think a year of Mike Owen winning with tackle is better than what most of the alternatives would be this year. And if you're going to have a rookie quarterback, I don't want to fire drill in the offensive line again. Uh, that's the last thing you need. That's the last thing you're, you need. You're like you're right. You know, like your opinion is going to be right. looked at as the right one. I get it. I just think that when you talk about building a team and you talk about where you're putting in your resources, Mike Onwenu has to play guard in this system, and I well, it's a lot also, of money to I pay mean, a guard. They might need a guard. They might need a guard. We still don't know who so, the right guard is. And uh, Mass Live reported over the weekend that Cole Strange isn't going to be ready for spring practices, and they're worried about their guard depth. Okay, so here here's the thing with the, with that. If you're telling me that left guard, because I think Mike Onwen is a right guard. Yeah. I think that's where he's at his best, is at right guard. If you're going to put Mike Onwenu at right guard, and yes, you're going to pay a premium for a guard, but because he's one of your core players or cornerstone players, the words that Elliot you. Uh, Wolf used, I think, yeah. his cornerstone players. Fine. Totally fine with that. You know me. I'm offensive line guy. Right. I'm totally fine with that. I think one of the biggest mistakes they've ever made is letting Joe Tooney walk. Yeah. Like That that was a huge mistake. So if you're going to pay Mike Onwenu and you're going to play him in the right spot and you're just going to say, this is a, one of our guys that we're building around, totally cool with that. Left guard needs to be up for grabs. It ain't Cole Strange's job. Because City So, I sounds think, like it might not be. I think City So had better film than Cole Strange has over the first two years. So I would put City So at left. I put Michael Wanu at right. You obviously have David Andrews in the middle. That's a pretty good start. I get. I just, I I really worry about what it's going to look like with a young quarterback back there. With if you take Michael and Wanu out, we don't know what Cole Strange. I'm not taking Michael and Wanu out. I'm just. I don't want to no, play him no, as a tackle. I I don't want to play him at tackle. I would for the year just because I don't I don't think it's not a good option, but I think the other options are worse. When you if they had a solid, do you think? Do you think let me ask you this: Do you think Jonah Williams is worse? Okay, what are you doing at left tackle? Well, that, that's not the question. No, but here, <laughs> so let me say what I was about. What I was about to say was, if they had a left tackle, I'd be totally on board with you, right? Because you can add one starting tackle, and we we always talk about this, right? Four of the five. If you have four of the five, you can cover up the fifth spot. And by the way, I think that's part of the reason. I think Owen Wendell is a better tackle than you do also just because I think he was overcompensating for a lot last year. I think that hurt him. Maybe. But, I mean, he he, he gives up his, his edge a lot. He gets run around a lot. I look at, all right, if there's one spot you're going to cover up, you have to have four of the five. Okay, so you sign Jonah Williams. That's one tackle. Yep. Are you also signing Tyron Smith? Are you banking? Yeah. Are you so sure at 34 you're going to get a starting caliber tackle? I would say that you're go because you're, you're already probably covering up at one of your guard spots. Why? Because we don't know Cole Strange gonna be ready to start season. I I'm out with Cole Strange. All right, so you're covering up a left guard then. No, you're playing City at left guard. All right, what are you doing at right guard? Mike Onwenu. I'm saying if Onwenu doesn't come back, why is Onwenu not coming back? Because this was your your hype that you signed no, Jonah I, Williams. Are you signing Jonah Williams and Mike Onwenu? Yes. Oh, I'd be okay with that. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Just don't play Onwenu at tackle. Not in this system. It doesn't work. I don't like it. On Wenu at guard, Jonah Williams at right tackle. I think Jonah Williams is a right tackle, yeah. ideally. Worst case scenario, you, if he, the rookie isn't ready, then you can flip Jonah to the left side. And Jonah's the left tackle for a year. And then who's at right tackle? Then you probably have to put Mike back out at right tackle, which I don't like. But 
if that that's like the that's the worst. But case okay, scenario. so to bring it back to the original point, <laughs> to bring it back to the original point, yes, it all gets a lot harder without Mike Gonwenu on the roster. Yeah, I'm not letting him walk. I just want to make sure that we are aware of where he's going to play. And the fact is, is that your your allocation of resources of paying a right guard 16, 17, 18 million dollars isn't great. It's fine, especially if you hit on the pick on the rookie, right? Like you have to hit on that pick. I mean, you have to hit. on So that basically, pick. what just to to because we've been all over the place. Yeah. So to sum it up, what I would do on the offensive line from left to right, life left tackle probably a rookie. Yeah. Worst case scenario, left tackle Jonah Williams, right? Yeah. Left tackle, rookie. Left guard, City So. Center, David Andrews. Right guard, Big Mike. Right tackle, Jonah Williams. Yeah. That's what I would do. And maybe on the left side, maybe you sign somebody that's not that impressive, like a Jermaine Illuminor or something like that, just to have an extra as insurance. As yeah. an extra veteran. Well, body. no, I think the idea is Mike when is your insurance because you can move Jonah Williams back over. I yeah. would and I, that's if the guy that you drafted 34 is not ready. You, you know, if Kingsley yeah. Suamitai is uh, – I just said his name correctly. And then Suamitia. I Suamitia is not ready, then you can have Jonah Williams play left. I'd go – I'm just – I'm so worried about left tackle being the question mark. I'm so worried about that. I'd sign Tyron Smith, get you through the year. He's not coming here. You don't think so? They can pay him the most. So. They, they, you got to use that money somehow. You got to throw that money at somebody. I'd, I'd give the bag Tyron Smith for a year. You get a year out of him. Kick the can down the road again at left tackle. Whoever you got to you got to come out the, of this draft with one of these tackles. Organize the middle. Well, so here's the thing. organize the middle however you want. And I guess yeah, if Mike. Yeah, one of the ta- one of the ta- you got to draft a tackle, and one of them's gonna one of your guys that you're counting on is gonna be a rookie. But you it's got to hit on that pick. Like it's a really good class. Yeah, it's a really good class, and it's not like rookies don't play. You know, guy rookies play all the time at that position, especially when you're they're a highly touted good rookie. You know, yeah. Um, look, it, it's not perfect. It's not. Well, let me ask: it, Is Patrick Paul ready? He should be. Been is in college for like seventeen it, years. You don't know because <laughs> you don't know when you're going through free agency who you're gonna have a shot at. What if there's a run on tackle and you plan on getting tackle at thirty four, and then suddenly nobody's there? Suddenly your guy's not there. Like I just. Yeah, I hear you. I'm not saying you can't start a rookie, but the idea of, I guess, adding Jonah Williams kind of helps. Like, if you don't have one of Mike, Mike Onwenu, Jonah Williams, Tyron Smith on your roster when you get into the draft, that's terrifying to me. Yeah, I agree. I think you have to come out of this free agency class. I'd still retain Big Mike. I'm just trying to tell people that I just don't think he's a tackle. That's right. it. And I, I, it does scare me a little bit to pay a guard that much and money. That's, but and it that's, is what I it guess is. that's fine. I'm just saying, if you, we both agree he's important to retain. Yep. He's harder to retain than Kyle Duggar, so that's the guy you tag. That's my point. Only what thing I wonder about that is how close they are with Mike on when he won a contract. All the reports make it sound like they're not. But maybe who knows? Maybe the reports are so wrong. You're right. But the other thing you have to remember: look, if they come out, watch. They'll tonight announce an extension with Unwenu, and we just wasted right. ten minutes. Well, because the thing you have to remember is that he doesn't have an agent. So, unless you're getting stuff from the Patriots side, and maybe you are, there's that one reporter that's in with Mike Unwenu well, that has, might get some information. He has advisors. It's not him individually. But going there's in not and a lot of people. This. Like there's not all this information. This time of year comes from the agent. Yeah. All of it. And yeah. there's, no, there's no agent involved. So it, it's been pretty quiet, I would say. Like, there's maybe some rumblings. I don't know. I'm with you. I, they, can't let, they can't let good offensive talent walk on the offensive line like they have the last couple of years. They trade Shaq Mason. Let Ted Karras go. Let Joe Tooney go. They can't keep doing that. Uh, but I, I do think they need two tackles. Yeah. Whether I mean, yeah, they do. No, they need two. Ta- I mean, that's not a take. That's a they, need, they don't have any tackles. But I'm talking about two guys that can start at tackle. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think that's a take. I think that's just factual. But if you're okay, I'm not. If you're going to play Mike at, at right tackle, uh, I you don't need I to attack. Saying okay, yeah, I was all right. I I I just I will die on this hill about him being a guard. All I'll right. die on this hill. I mean, their line didn't get monumentally better when they moved him to tackle last year or anything. So, all right, uh, last couple of minutes here. Let's talk about some external guys. Uh, where are you on? So. Where are you on this receiver class in free agency? Out. Is there anybody that interests you? Anyone that tickles your fancy? 
Calvin Ridley, let's start there. Like, are you a no on Calvin Ridley? Well, here's if you're going to be taking tackle at 34, I think you need to sign him as the bridge guy. But that's the thing. I think he's a bridge guy. He's going to be 30. I don't think he solves your long term. And you're not quarterback you have to solve long term because that's you don't bridge quarterback. That's just not right. what you do. Not in the, the sense of the other positions. You can't solve tackle and wide receiver both long term. And I just, I don't see a, this offseason, I don't see a long term answer. Unless you, let me rephrase that. Unless you find your Puka Nakua, right? Yeah. You're not going to clearly walk away from the offseason with tackle locked up long term and receiver locked up long term. I was hoping Unless maybe. Unless you trade down and don't take the quarterback. No, you got to take the quarterback. I'm saying you got to take the quarterback. That's a, that's a non starter for me. Okay. Um, Is it not a non starter for you? It's not a non starter. Like, I, I, the trade down scenarios are intriguing. This is a whole different thing that we shouldn't get into yeah. in the last eight minutes All of the right. show. But um, the trade down scenarios are. Calvin intriguing. Ridley's a bridge guy. Everybody else I look at, like, Darnell Mooney to me is a nope. gadgety player. Marquise Brown's way too small. Don't trust that. Gabe Davis can get overpaid. Gabe Davis. I want nothing to do with Gabe Davis. He's the most inconsistent player in the league. You know how I hate that. He's going to get overpaid on like the three games a year that he's not right. Nothing to do with Gabe. Yeah. Well, I, I did this number. I think it's forty-seven percent of his receiving yards came in three games last year. Yeah. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, Schefter floated. Michael Thomas did not realize he was still in the NFL. Slant boy. Yeah. There's two guys that interest me, but they interest me as, and I know this is what nobody wants to hear. They interest me as the guy next to the guy. Yeah. If you could trade up, and it sounds like you don't want to do this, but if you trade up and you get Brian Thomas, if you trade up, you get A.D. Mitchell. That's your wide receiver one. That's yeah. your guy. That's yeah. your dude. You still need a good number two. And like, I like Kendrick Bourne in that role. I don't know if he comes back. The two guys I like is like solid wide receiver twos, but I wouldn't add to solve the problem. These are not replacements for Devontae Parker. These are additions are Josh Reynolds and Donovan Peoples-Jones. I like Josh Reynolds. Josh Reynolds had himself a nice season. I think he made himself some money, but he's 29. I think he yeah. is what he is at this point. I think that season was like his peak. You're not going up from there. Donovan Peoples-Jones is younger. He's 25. He did have an 800-yard season under Alex Van Pelt, but you're banking on projection there. You're you're paying for a projection. You're not paying for performance. I, I like Josh Reynolds. Tough. Goes over the middle. Blocks. Yeah, runs routes, Big strong guy. hands. Like I, I like Josh Reynolds. I think he's a a, a really good complimentary player. Hey, that's what I was looking for. Like yeah. these are complimentary guys. These are not. Hey, we got our guy. We're good. I like Calvin Ridley for them. Uh, I it's going to cost a lot of money because he doesn't solve anything. I, I the reason why I like Calvin Ridley is that if you do draft the quarterback, which yeah. I think we both think they should, I think you have to have one. You have to have one NFL player in that room. All right, so and I'm not holding that against Pop Douglas or anything like that, but like you have to have a one. Veteran. You have to veteran. You have to have one veteran who's a dude that's had thousand yard seasons. That's that's a player. So uh, let me say this: if they do your plan, yeah. where it's quarterback tackle, yep, yeah, sign Calvin Ridley. He's the bridge guy. But I don't want to sign Cal. Like next off season, we're I don't care that Calvin Ridley's here. We're getting back to yep. if the quarterback they takes a hit, the tackle they takes a hit. We're going receiver, receiver, receiver at the top of the draft next year. That's all I want to hear well, about. Well, depending, though, because let's say— No, no, because he's 30. He's 30. Uh, no, just let me finish. Let's. So the other thing I like about Calvin Ridley, and I know, you know, look, he, he gambled on, on sports, so maybe not the best role model, okay? But in terms of, like, let's say that they draft at 68. Let's yeah. say they draft Xavier Leggett. Let's say they draft Ricky Pearsall. Let's say they draft, uh, you know, one of the Washington kids, whatever, whoever yeah. it is. That guy now in a room with Calvin Ridley, who's a pro, who's done it, who's had good production in the league. You know, all of a sudden, you know, you start to mentor that guy. Maybe this class at receiver is so loaded yeah. and it's so deep that there's a chance that you could get 68 essentially like a low second round pick, right? It's like the top of the third round. So there's a chance that this year, the six, the receiver you're getting at 68 is actually a receiver that you would get in the second round in most years. And now all of a sudden that guy that guy's a dude. So and that's fair. And look, I'm not out on. I, I think I was more dismissive than I actually am. I just I, Calvin Ridley is not. Or, you know, we talk about the drafting the quarterback and then getting him the receiver. It's uh, Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase, and yep, and two and Jalen Waddle. And he's a he's a probably like a mid tier number one. No, but here's the, I don't. He's not. He's not that guy. He's the no. guy before that guy. No, he's not that guy. He is bridging you to that guy because you can't get that I'm guy hoping, right now. I, I just that that's my view. I would not give yeah. Calvin Ridley five years. No, I give him three. I give him three, and I don't know that I guarantee the third. I give him three, and you hope that this receiver class is so good 
that whether it's at 34, it's at 68, or however you, you dice it up, you get the receiver, and he ends up – you hit on a day two receiver. Yeah. Christian Watson in Green Bay, right? Like, you hit on but a day But is Christian two. Watson even – yeah, I guess he is that guy for them. I guess he is. Yeah, I mean they guy, have but... Christian Rodson, they have Romeo Dobbs, they have Jaden Reed. I maybe it's so, all right. So maybe the draft pick pans out, but I don't think you're coming out of the off season. Maybe you come out of the season at the end of the season it pans out. I don't think you're. Yeah, there's a. I don't think it's guaranteed that next year we're sitting there saying wide receiver one's taken care of. No, I don't think signing Calvin Ridley answers that question. Not necessarily, but I think you're sitting there next year saying you still have Calvin Ridley under contract. You have a really good player in Xavier Leggett, who's a young player yeah. that you're really excited about. And then maybe you're still taking another receiver, but now that receiver is coming in to be your Jamar Chase. And now all of a sudden you're the Bengals and you have three receivers. Right. And you, yeah, now yeah, now yeah, you're yeah. cooking with gas. Uh, I, I, I like the idea of Calvin Ridley. I do. I don't like Darnell Mooney, Gabe Davis, all that tier. You can you can take it or leave it. Yeah. It's Kendrick Bourne. It's Nelson Aguilar. It's, it's those At that point, pay again. Kendrick Bourne. Yeah. At that point, or – Go down and get Josh Reynolds or Donovan. Do you have any interest in DPJ or not? Yeah, uh, because of his experience with AVP uh, in you know the production that he had in the one year with AVP, it's it's not a terrible idea. Uh, uh, last one, tight end. Uh, just really quickly, I hear a lot that this isn't a very good free agent tight end class. It's not great. Like it's not. I'm not telling you it's like this elite. Like there's all these tight ends available. But I I guess when you know with Dalton Schultz out of it, it's a little bit worse. I I do like Gerald Everett. I do like Noah Fant for them. I, I do like some of these guys that have had some experience in Cleveland, like a Harrison Bryan, Austin Hooper, like those types of players. I'm not telling you, and, and obviously Hunter Henry. Like, I'd bring Hunter Henry back. Right. I'm not sitting here telling you that you're going to get Travis Kelsey out of this free agency class, but can we kick the can down the road on tight end in a bad tight end draft and get out of here with at least one or two guys that can play the position for the 2024 season? I think the answer you is gotta yes. sign, You got to sign a starting tight end. I don't think you're getting a starting tight end in the draft. I just don't yeah. think. As much as I like Jatavion Sanders, I wonder how realistic he is for them at this point with the way free agency is going. Yeah. I really like Noah Fant. I just think he's a, he's that kind of an athletic, well-rounded tight end that plays well in this system. Yeah. All right. Last, 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 last thing. You could have one player out of this free agency class Monday, 12 noon hits, Rap sheet and Chef. Okay, besides Chris Jones, because he tweeted earlier that like a, a I saw that. I know. I just I, yeah. Uh, you could have one player when the when noon hits and Rap sheet and Schefter uh, unload all the drafts that have been sitting there since the combine. Who do you want going to the Patriots? Number one target. So, well, I think the best player would be Christian Wilkins. I'm with you, obviously, but I I want the tackle things. I want to know they have a tackle. I want to okay. know they have what like. Tyron Smith. Tyron Smith, Jonah Williams, Please. Mike Onwenu. Give yeah. me one of those three guys. I know you don't think Onwenu is a tackle, but give me one of those three guys. Why don't we just give us one of the two actual tackles? All right, tackles. fine. Jonah Williams, Tyron Smith. Let me hit that notification, and then I can breathe, and I can be a little more excited when they pay Christian Wilkins instead of being like, shoot, does this mean they're not paying a tackle? Christian Wilkins. Local kid, great player, him and Barmore next to each other. Good luck to offensive lines yeah. on the interior. That's how you do free agency. Go after the talent. Don't chase the position. Just because a guy plays receiver, just because he plays tackle, the classes stink. Don't do it. Can I don't give overpay. You, can I give you my one sleeper? And I don't think this is going to happen, yeah, but I would love for them to make the call. Yeah. Steph Gilmore. Sure. I, I think they need a second. I'm all for paying defensive talent. They need a second all boundary corner. Well, but more than that, like they need a second boundary corner. He fills the role. Imagine you talk about the wide receiver getting learned from Calvin Ridley. Imagine Christian Gonzalez getting learned from Steph Gilmore. Gives yeah. you a good second boundary corner for the year and is a great influence on Gonzalez. I'd love to see Steph Gilmore back here. I'd love it. Awesome. All right. Uh, Alex and I will be back next week, uh, probably back to our regular time. Not sure yet. We'll find out. Uh, we'll talk, obviously, all about free agency next week. We'll have to put a pause on the draft. I'm sorry. I know. That's yeah, why we'll, you I'm sure in. we'll still end up uh, We'll probably talk a little draft, but uh, we're going to be really free agency heavy next week. We all sorts of free agency stuff planned here on Patriots.com for next week. Probably an emergency podcast, maybe, Morell, if we have to, on Monday and then Tuesday, Thursday, PU and Cash 22. So we'll see you guys then. Stay tuned. Thanks. Bye. Thank you for downloading this podcast. Subscribe on Apple, Google Play, and everywhere else you listen. Like the show? Please rate and review us. Listener comments and ratings help keep us high in the podcast rankings so new listeners can find us. Be sure to check Patriots.com for more news and more podcasts.